I think this one is working. If you hear me, then write in the comments. If you see me well, write in the comments. Oh. Thank you, Devora. I, I see a man, but I need to see, yeah, I hear you. Okay, thank you, Rita. Yes, thank you. Um, very well. <clears throat> so, <coughs> in Judaism we say, Every delay is for the good. So not for nothing you've been waiting uh, 20 minutes for the broadcast to go up. And exactly an hour before the broadcast, I was talking with a dear friend. And I was talking about how when things go bad and you run into challenges and you run into difficulties and things don't work out and you're about to give up, that's your indication that you're actually doing the right thing, you're going in the right way because there's resistance. If there's no resistance, uh, nothing will, there's not going to be any growth. So nothing comes easy. I see in my life everything comes with a push. So we want to make a live video, Moshe Rabbeinu, and everything that can go wrong, goes wrong. So I'm going to look again in the comments. Please let me know. Uh, again, that you hear me well, see me well, and uh, okay, uh, definitely now is not the time to start writing questions on the comments. You can write uh, later on, there's not a shame if we have some time, then uh, we'll do some questions, we'll see how it goes. But let me first uh, start the broadcast with wishing you Chag Sameach. Uh, this is a Chag, is a holiday, the passing of a tzaddik is, a, is like a holiday. So it's a very special day. I hope you are taking advantage of it. And we have a lot more to cover, so I'm going to first of all briefly let you know very quickly what we're going to talk about today, so you can have the desire to stay on the chat and not to say, uh, okay, I'll see the recording. So, first of all, we are going to talk today about the life of Moshe Rabbeinu. Today is his passing day and also his birthday. Uh, also today, by the way, is the passing day, the Hidula of Esther, Queen Esther. So we have a double power tonight. And we're going to go a little bit about Moshe Rabbeinu's life. Uh, there's so much more to talk about Moshe Rabbeinu that I decided to take a part of his life and uh, and to take a message from it because Moshe Rabbeinu is called Rabbeinu no other uh, individual got the title of Rabbeinu uh, Yosef Atzadik, uh, Shmuel Hanavi, David HaMelech, the king, the prophet Moshe got the title of Rabbeinu, our teacher because he brought us the Torah and he taught us the Torah and up until today everything that any student will ever come up with, any chidush in the Torah, any twist or angle in the Torah, Moshe Rabbein already knew about it. So he's our teacher. So what do you take from your teacher? The best lessons ever. So every part in Moshe Rabbein's life can, first of all, indicates about the individual, and there's a lesson for each and every one of us to take. And on such a powerful day, from many stories in his life, I decided to take one story that has a few angles uh, of uh, looking at it and definitely a very, very powerful uh, uh, m m message that one can and should apply. It's a very, very powerful day. The great sages of Kabbalah explained that the seven days be between Zayn, Adar, and Purim are seven days of Tshuva like we have between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And we have seven days, from the seventh day of Adar till the fourteenth day, till next Sunday, for Purim, seven days to do Tshuva, and with the power of Moshe Rabbeinu, then, then we, can, we can do 
the nature of the month of Adar, which is Ben Hafok, when you switch everything, the complete opposite. So we're going to talk about a very interesting uh, uh, topic tonight, something that uh, I don't think there's much out there talking about the life of Moshe Rabbeinu. In many of my classes, I, I, uh, I uh, share information, but uh, we never actually learned much. There's a lot of Midrashim, there's a lot of books that uh, talking about his history. Tonight we're going to talk about something very, very uh, special. Before we start the, the, the class, the lecture, uh, I'm going to share a dedication uh, because a very special lady that uh, unfortunately uh, went through a very hard Nisayon that I don't wish to anyone and unfortunately a few years ago uh, gave birth to a, a sick baby that only lived for five days and uh, the death day of this baby who was called Israel is Zayn Adar. And this uh, special lady has been asking me for years to talk about Zayn Adar and the significance. And finally, I found uh, the time, not anything else, but the time to talk about it. So we're going to dedicate the class, first of all, to her, but we're also going to, and her family for success and everything else that she wishes for herself. But we're also going to dedicate the class to the, uh, the little uh, boy, Israel. Uh, but we're going to dedicate the class to a few ladies, and I will include in that all the rest of the ladies, that, by the way, Zayn Adar is a very powerful la uh, day for specifically for ladies. We're not going to talk about it today, but just ladies should know that it's a very powerful day. Your prayers are powerful, your tshuva is powerful. So, unfortunately, the, the lady that, the, the special lady that I'm talking about experienced birth, but right after that death which is very significant to Zayn Adar. Moshe was born on Zayn Adar and also died on Zayn Adar. But unfortunately, there are many women who cannot conceive a child. So we're going to dedicate the class to the names that I'm going to read, which are uh, Chasia Hadassah Bat Sara, Chaya Bat Rezel, and Leah Bat Yochevet. And as others say, there should be mothers very soon. She should be Bezera Chaya Bekayama. And she should marry their many, many healthy kids. Along with all the women who need to get pregnant, you don't have to write the names over there. I'm blessing all the women who need to get pregnant that Bezat Hashem with this class and the merit of this class that every woman that cannot bring, a, 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 have a child should get pregnant in the merit of this class. Mm -hmm. And we're going to dedicate this class also for Klal Israel, for all of Israel, for the hostages to finally come back, for, for uh, uh, the poor families, for the the wounded people, for everyone around the world that is suffering from health and financial issues, money issues. We have issues in bundles. So, um, Bezad Hashem, Hashem should turn everything to Torah for good, in the merit of Chodesh Adar, in the merit of Zayn Adar. And even though we're going into the storm of Chavlei Mashiach, uh, that doesn't mean that life cannot be uh, calm and good and successful. As I've been saying many, many times in chapter 91 in Tehilim, that a thousand will fall from this side and a thousand from that side, and nothing will hit you. So, Bezad Hashem, all good blessings and wishes to everyone. Bezad Hashem, after the class, I'll give a general blessing to everybody in the merit of this day. And uh, I was able to, I, I actually, I don't know if I can say it live, uh, I was able to get to Meron in time. Let's put it this way. Uh, I don't know if I can actually say live that I was... Okay, it doesn't matter. Uh, whoever uh, missed and they want to send names uh, to pray, when I'm going to pray in Meron, you can still send names because I'm going to have to go back there. Uh, but in the peak of the day, I was able to weasel myself in with uh, a few connections and we're going to end that uh, here. Uh, we were able to pray to the Kadosh Baruch but if you want to still submit names, I'm still going to go back there. Now, uh, before we start, I know, I know, I know, I know, you can't wait for me to start, but I'm asking you, I'm asking you, please like the video, share the video, subscribe to the channel, write comments. It helps the channel because my channel is kind of like fighting and it's 
kind of going up. So all these uh, uh, interactions uh, help a lot. And please share the video. It's live now. Share it on your WhatsApp, on your Facebook, so that people can log in and watch it live too. Uh, and you might be asking, what's the benefit if I watch it live? I'll go and watch it later on. It's recorded. Then live, you might be lucky and you can squeeze in a question. And I'll try to take questions later on. And maybe you'll be the lucky one. Uh, a few announcements before we start, because I have to take uh, this uh, opportunity to announce a few things. First of all, next week is Purim. As I have mentioned many, many times, we have a few things that should get your interest. First of all, on atzmut.org you can find a Purim guide with everything that you need to know, from all the uh, pre-Purim things that you need to know during Purim. Go to that page, the links are in the description of the video. And I believe they are. All the links that I'm going to talk about now are in the description of the video. Uh, go to the poor guide and prepare yourself the right way. Don't send me emails a minute after and tell me, I didn't get a message about Machatzit HaShekel. So I'm telling you now, go to that page. I believe it's at smooth.org forward slash Purim guide. If not, you'll find the link in the description. Learn about Purim. See what you need to do. Prepare yourself the right way. Learn the laws and so forth. More than that, as every year we do in Purim and Hanukkah, we have a raffle, raffle for the art pictures. Uh, the information is online. If you didn't see or you don't know about it, go to the link in the description for the Purim raffle. Please participate in the raffle. It supports uh, us, it supports our operation, and also supports the local artist that creates the paintings. Uh, another important thing for the ones of you who are uh, living in the United States, as you know or may not, uh, in two and a half weeks I am coming to the United States. I'm going to be in the East Coast this visit. I'm going to have one lecture in New Jersey on April 7th, one lecture in New York on April 8th, and one lecture in Miami on April uh, 14th. I'm wrong when I'm saying a lecture. This is not going to be a lecture. It's going to be an event. The lecture is part of the event. And I can tell you already, you don't want to miss this event. People are emailing us and WhatsApping us that they want to know the location and area because they're buying tickets. People are flying from Canada, from Mexico. You don't want to miss this event. Now, okay, if you're not in New York, New Jersey, and Miami, then after Pesach, Bezal Hashem coming to Los Angeles and probably to cities around, maybe San Diego, I don't know, maybe Phoenix or Las Vegas. And the plan is that in June is to come to the Midwest, Chicago, Dallas, Houston, uh, and many other cities, but that is uh, still in the air. California is right after Pesach. Uh, so first of all, if you want to find more information, link in the description, go to the page. Right now the page is not so full. Uh, we're still working on the location, and that's my request to you. We, we need to know what size venue to get. Therefore, I'm asking everybody to RSVP to uh, any of the lectures that are coming. And I apologize now to the viewers who are not from any of these cities, but the next broadcast it will be your city. So uh, for the ones who are planning on coming, in the description of the video there's a link to RSVP. That way we can know how many people are planning on coming so we can prepare with the right venue. I haven't been to the United States for five years. And thousands and thousands of you and my followers never have seen me. So I know it's going to be a very large event, both in New York, both in Miami. It's going to be huge events. So I'm asking if you can help us, RSVP, let us know how many people are coming. We need to know if we're taking a hall for 1,000 people or 3,000 people. Or as my manager said, are we taking the Yankee Stadium? So I don't think we're taking the Yankee Stadium yet, but we still need to know how to accommodate everybody the right way. I'm telling you already, you do not want to miss this event. And if you're not in New York, New Jersey, and Miami, wait for your city. And I don't know if this event will be broadcast or uh, filmed. It's something that you have to be. I'm telling you, it's going to be huge. Uh, another thing that I want to uh, uh, inform you all, the cruise that was scheduled last November and was canceled, uh, delayed by the war, uh, is back on schedule. Uh, I believe it's June 16, the cruise is for the Greek, no uh, Turkey. Uh, find out all the information, also the link in the description. 
you'll find all the information. If you can join us, it's going to be an amazing, amazing uh, event. <clears throat> Last but not least, I know, I know, I know, I know, I, know, I, know, I, know, I, know. <laughs> I want to see how many are, are impatient. No, I'm not, I cannot come to Pakistan. No. Uh, <laughs> maybe one day I'll come to Pakistan. But, uh, uh, but greetings back to you. Uh, but anyways, one last thing I want to uh, announce. <clears throat> the book of the Omer is ready uh, to be purchased. The information, same thing, is in the link in the description. The book right now is in printing, so I don't have one to show you. We'll put uh, in the page, you have a picture of it, all the information. Very, very powerful book. Half the book is information about the Omer, and the next is a specific guide every day, what to do throughout the Omer, with all the description, all the information, everything that you need to know to have the most amazing Sfirah the Omer you ever had. So you can order it fast. If you're planning to come to the lecture, you can either get it at the lecture, I, I, uh, 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 you can definitely pre-order, and then can come and pick it up. But if you're ordering any one shipped, that can uh, be uh, too. And uh, I think I'm done with announcements. So, <clears throat> so today, like I mentioned before, is both the birthday and the death day of Moshe Rabbeinu, also the death day of Estela Malkal, Queen Estela. And there are so much, there's so much more to talk about when it comes to Moshe Rabbeinu. Uh, there's one thing that really hit me when I started learning about Moshe Rabbeinu, which I want to raise this question tonight, that Moshe Rabbeinu was punished not to enter the land of Israel. I'm sure you know the story. He was uh, uh, supposed to talk to the rock, and instead he hit the rock. In the eyes of the master of the universe, that was the uh, 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 desecration of the name of Hashem, Chilul Hashem. Yeah, I didn't tell you to hit the rock. Uh, you would make it look like a great miracle if you just talked to the rock. And to make a long story short, Moshe Rabbeinu did not get the, the approval to get into the land of Israel. Which, okay, I'm not questioning Hashem. I have a different question, which took me many, many years to, uh, to understand how come he wasn't allowed to be buried in Israel? He was a, a, not allowed to get into Israel, but on top of that, also not to be buried in Israel. Why? Yosef HaTzadik died in Mitzrayim, the, the coffin and the bones were brought to Israel. Yaakov died in Mitzrayim, coffin and the bones were brought to Israel. How come Moshe Rabbeinu couldn't bring, how come they couldn't bring the bones of Moshe Rabbeinu into Israel and bury him in Israel? Not to come into Eretz Israel, that's one thing. But not to be buried, what's the connection with the punishment that he got? So, Really, there's a story in the Midrash that's talking about the life of Moshe Rabbeinu that hits the nail on its head. And that story actually gives over a very, very powerful message, and that's what we're going to talk about today. But I want to start with a little bit going backwards to the beginning, the day that Moshe Rabbeinu was born. Many, many commentaries saying so many different things. When he was born, the room was filled with light. Uh, he, when he was born, he was born already circumcised. Different types of commentary are saying how great he was from the moment that he came to the world. But unfortunately, from the harsh decree of uh, Pharaoh, there was a danger to keep the boys. So you know the story, he was put in the, in the, in the teva. And uh, very quickly, the daughter of Pharaoh, but yeah, found him, adopted him, and uh, raised him as a child. Now, uh, after two years, after two years when she, when she was raising him, then she brought him back to the house of Pao. So for two years, she was raising him and she, she, nobody knew about him. When he was two years old, that's when uh, Batya named him Moshe. The Torah doesn't give you the specific times, it just says right away that she named it. But really for two years she was hiding him, and only on his two-year birthday, 
then she named him Moshe, even though that his real name was Yikutiel. Yochel and his mother named him Yikutiel, and of course, uh, why would uh, Bat Paro know that? Then she named him Moshe, because in Hebrew, Moshe, same root of the name, Kim Meshitihu Minayo, because they pulled him out of the, out of the Niles, and so that's how she named him. But really, his uh, name that was given by his mother was Yikutiel. When Moshe Rabbein was three years old, then his, uh, the daughter of Paro, but yeah, brought Moshe Rabbeinu first time for Paro to meet the grandson. And uh, it doesn't indicate if she tells him that she found him, adopted him, and got somehow pregnant. Uh, but nevertheless, she appears in the palace with a three-year-old. And uh, there's an interesting story, which I'm sure many, many know that as everybody was sitting, Moshe, as a three-year-old, goes to Paro, and he takes off his crown. And the old advisors didn't, uh, didn't like that, uh, specifically uh, Paro. The three-year-old is coming and taking his crown off. So at the time, the advisor of Paro was uh, Bilam, the famous Bilam that later on came to uh, try to destroy us, he was the advisor of Paro, who told him, remember the dream you told me, my master, about the child of the nation of the Jews? Then that's the child that will cause the problem. This is the child that you, you need to kill this child right away. This child came from the Jews, well, from the Israelites, from Bnei Israel. And right away, the suggestion was to kill the child. The story says that right away came down Malach Gabriel, the angel Gabriel, looked like one of the advisors. And he says, well, why do you want to kill this poor innocent boy? This is not a, a holy child that you sang from the Bnei Israel, from the tribe of the Greek. This is some simple child. It's very simple. Just put a very expensive uh, uh, stone, or like a ruby, something very, very expensive in front of him, and you'll see. If he's, like you're saying, son of kings and will be a great prophet, what would he do? He will take this precious stone. And if he doesn't, then he's just another basic, regular child. The advisors found it uh, good, and also Paolo. They put the precious stone, it was called Shoham. Shoham is one of the, the 12 stones that go on the breastplate. And they placed the stone on the, in front of Moshe, and Moshe reached out his hand to grab for the stone. Malach Gabriel moved his hand, and instead of touching the stake in the stone, he took a coil from whatever fire there was there, came, put it in, in next to his mouth, and burned his lips. And that's what caused him to be uh, with, uh, not really stuttering, but some difficulties with speaking. But right away, everybody was saying, you see, this is not the son of kings and a prophet, it's just a simple child, let him live. And that's how Paul decided to let Moshe Rabbeinu live, and from that day on, Moshe grew up in the palace of Paul for 15 years. So from the age of three, Moshe Rabbeinu is relocating to the palace of Paro for 15 years. Then in the age of 18, he becomes a man. He requests from his, from his mother and from the king, he wants to go out, he wants to see what's going on here. Okay, when Moshe Rabbeinu, the prince, goes out, you can imagine what an entourage and chariots and guards and, you know, the son, the grandson of the king. So it wasn't that he was just walking around in the street and uh, looking at uh, souvenirs in the market. Yeah, when Moshe Rabbeinu goes into the, to the crowd, he goes in like a prince. And to make a very long story short, what I'm telling you now is all found in the, in the Torah itself with many commentaries and more information in the Midrash. And then, of course, the story says, goes that Moshe Rabbeinu sees an uh, Egyptian uh, guard beating up uh, uh, a uh, Ben Israel, a uh, Jew, and beating him up with no reason and really like beating up until he almost dies. And uh, Moshe Rabbeinu. Sound. sound. Can you hear me? Everybody says, somebody says there's no sound. Can you hear me? 
You don't have to be that quiet. Or maybe there's no sound. Oh, okay, you can hear. Is it okay now? <laughs> yes, sound? There is sound. Okay, so you can hear it. Okay. Uh, so Moshe Rabbeinu sees the Egyptian hitting the, the slave, and he does not like what he sees, and he kills him. Of course, more details to it. Moshe Rabbeinu looks in Ruach HaKodesh. He wants to see that nobody in his lineage will come out, a king, a prophet, some good guy, uh, if not worth keeping him alive. And he sees in Ruach HaKodesh that it's okay to kill him. He doesn't kill him with a fist, fist or with a stick. He says a holy name and looks at him and kills him. The Zohar says something very interesting about this encounter, that Moshe Rabbeinu, you know what I'm going to leave now? Wait, wait with that thought. Remind me with the Zohar, what the Zohar says. I don't want to say that now because it's kind of going to ruin a few steps forward. But nevertheless, Moshe Rabbeinu kills the Egyptian, Tatan and Abiram, the masters of Roshon Ara, right away run to Paro, snitch to Paro what's going on, Right away, there's a warrant to the death of Moshe Rabbeinu. Many, many miracles have occurred. One miracle is that it says that when Moshe Rabbeinu came to the palace, uh, the order was to cut his neck, and when the sword hit his neck, the neck became hard like marble, and the sword could not uh, uh, penetrate. There's other miracles that says that all the guards in the palace became blind and, and uh, deaf couldn't see anything, they don't know what's going on, so he can uh, run away. Another uh, uh, commentary says that many, many angels came down to the palace, looked like Moshe Rabbeinu, and he was Moshe Rabbeinu everywhere, so they didn't know who's the Moshe Rabbeinu, and Moshe Rabbeinu could make a run for it. And there are more commentaries, but Moshe Rabbeinu makes his run for it, and he runs away from its eye. Okay. <clears throat> When he's running away from Mitzrayim, and again, I know when you're thinking about the story, you're imagining, uh, 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 you know, uh, Moshe Rabbeinu just running away from the palace and fleeing. But Moshe Rabbeinu also lived there. He, he was probably a little bit more smarter than we think. Why am I saying that? Because the Zohar says that when he left Mitzrayim, when he ran away, he took with him Yosef's staff. Moshe Rabbeinu was then already in a very high spiritual level. He had Ruach HaKodesh. He knew exactly who he was. He knew, he knew what's going on. He wasn't some uh, shepherd. So as he's going out of Mitzrayim, running away, he's taking Yosef's staff with him. How did he get it? It's not so important right, right now, but he runs away with the staff. Now, <clears throat> now let's go back again to the question that I started before. I'm just reminding you. Moshe Rabbeinu was not allowed to uh, enter the land of Israel. I asked before, how come he was not allowed to be buried in the land of Israel? Like Yaakov, like Yosef, like many others, that the bones were brought into the land of Israel. And there's a simple explanation for that. In the Torah, there's a simple explanation for everything. The simple, simple explanation is that Moshe Rabbeinu didn't want to be buried in Eretz Israel because he says the entire generation that I led in the desert and I led them out of Mitzrayim, they all died in the desert. So why would I leave them in the desert and go and get buried in Eretz Israel? I'll be buried in the desert with them and when Mashiach comes and there's a time for resurrection of the dead, I'll wake up the entire generation of the desert and bring them into Eretz Israel with me. Very simple explanation. Some may say the same exact thing when they were, uh, people were asking how come the Lubavitch Rebbe, uh, when he passed, was not requested to uh, be buried in Eretz Israel. And they built they build here a, a, a replica of his house in Brooklyn. Why not to be buried in Eretz Israel? The same answer that, that, that it was given. Everybody's in exile. I'm going to go and uh, live in Eretz Israel. When I'm in the exile, everybody's in exile. I have to be here to help everybody. Why do you think there are so many tzaddikim in so many different places? To be a, a lamp, to be a power for the ones who have who to lean on, to pray, to go and have, to have some comfort. But nevertheless, 
This is the simple explanation. But there's a much more deeper explanation than what we just said. This can be found in Yerkuchi Muni. That's where we're going to be reading from. I'm not going to read from the book because I don't want it to be a four-hour lecture. But if you want reference, go to Yerkuchi Muni. This is in the book of Shmot in chapter uh, 247, subchapter 188. When Moshe Rabbeinu uh, ran away from Mitzrayim, he wasn't, like I told you, a simple person. First of all, he was 18. I know, uh, I, I said it a few classes uh, many times that Moshe was 18. Somebody asked me not too long ago, what's the source of that? There are many sources of the ages of Moshe for everything, but from El Kushi Moni, what we're learning, it says clearly that he was 18. When he was two, he was brought to the house of Batya. When he was three, he was brought to the house of Paro and lived in the house of Paro for 15 years. El Kushi Moni says that he was 18 when he fled from Mitzrayim. Uh, but very interestingly, already when he was 18, he already had enemies. So first let's make it clear that Moshe Rabbeinu knew exactly who he was and he was a very powerful individual then. More than that, when Moshe Rabbeinu fled in Mitzrayim, he already had a few uh, 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 enemies on his resume. Why? Now this now says something very, very interesting about Moshe Rabbeinu. When Moshe Rabbeinu came to this world as Moshe Rabbeinu, that was his third visit in this world. The first time Moshe Rabbeinu came was in the body of heaven, the son of Adam Arishon. Cain killed heaven, and then Moshe Rabbeinu came, second incarnation, into Adam's third child, Shet. And then, uh, of course, died of old age and came back as Moshe Rabbeinu. So Moshe Rabbeinu as Moshe Rabbeinu is third time. So, what I told you before that I told you would remind me with the Zohar. But the Zohar says something very interesting. Moshe was heaven. Cain, the one who killed the heaven, got incarnated in the Egyptian person that Moshe Rabbeinu killed. So when Moshe Rabbeinu looked at that Egyptian person and looked in Ruach HaKodesh to see that there's nobody in the lineage, he also saw that that's the one who killed him. So there was a, how do you call it? You close the deal, I you owe you, I owe you. That's it. Moshe Rabbeinu killed him back. So Moshe Rabbeinu already had some enemies and the biggest enemy of all was Bil'am. Bil'am was the advisor of Paro, along with Yitro, and with uh, Eyob. These were three advisors of Paro. Uh, Yitro was uh, somewhere in the middle. Eyob was the one, uh, forgive, let him go. And, and Bil'am, of course, was, no, 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 get them. Uh, but nevertheless, Bil'am was the advisor of Paro, and he already had an issue with Moshe. He knew Moshe Rabbeinu, he knew what's going on here. And when Moshe Rabbeinu uh, ran away from the time, like I told you, one of the commentaries says that angels came down in the form of Moshe Rabbeinu and caused confusion so Moshe can run away. But in, uh, in a mysterious way, Bil'am got the message that Moshe wants to kill him. That somehow Bil'am got extremely scared of Moshe Rabbeinu and fled Mitzrayim with at the same time that Moshe Rabbeinu ran away, took with him his two sons and ran away. Now, <clears throat> when Bil'am ran away, he took his two sons. <clears throat> Interestingly, the Zohar names them. And it tells the name. I didn't find any reference anywhere that is mentioning the names of the sons of Bil'am. But the Zohar says the first uh, boy was Yunos, and the second was Yam, Yavramos, Yam, 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 excuse me, Yamavos. Yunus and Yamavos. These are the sons of Bil'am. And he ran away with them to a land that is called the land of Cush. Bil'am and their son, and both his sons, ran to the land of Cush. 
And Bilam was a politi 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 how do you say politic? Politician? Mm -hmm. He was a politician, he was a slimy uh, uh, politician, that's the only way you can say it. He was a sorcerer, he was a chef. But nevertheless, he whistled himself in and he became very friendly with the king of Kush. Okay. He becomes the, the, uh, key, the friend of the king of Kush that is called the king Kokunus. Kokunus or Kokunus. And he becomes very friendly with him and he somehow weaseled himself into the, to the government of the land of Kush. And uh, at the same time, Moshe Rabbeinu also fled to the land of Kush. Maybe that was like the United States. Everybody runs to the United States to look for refuge. I don't know. And the Midrash says that Kush was a very prosperous uh, uh, land. It wasn't some uh, dinky uh, city somewhere. It was a very big uh, metropolis, met metropolis, kind of like a Mitzrayim, and, uh, not in the same level, but it was a very, very uh, big city. And uh, happened to be that at the time, the king of Kush went to wage war against uh, the sons of Kedem. These are names that you, if you read in the Torah, you, you will see all the names, you'll find sound familiar. But the king of Kush, Koknos, uh, went to war with the sons of Kedem, and he took with him his entire army, and he went and had a great victory. But he wanted to leave somebody behind to take care of the, the kingdom, so he made the mistake of his life, and he left Bilam to take care of business. Within days, weeks, months, whatever he took, Bilam made a revolution, how do you say, revolution? He made a revolution and kicked him out, and he made himself the ruler. Now Bilam knew that at some point the war will be over and the king will come back. So he built a huge wall surrounding the land of Kush, and he made it such a sophisticated uh, fort, fortress fort, that the entire uh, uh, wall was surrounded with water and he made it huge wall water and then he dug holes all around the, the water and he put snakes there. So anyone that wants to get close, you have water, you have snakes, deadly snakes, you have walls. And sure enough, the day came that the king won the war and he comes back to Kush. He sees the, the wall from far away, he doesn't recognize the wall. Okay, he thought maybe, I don't know, the, the Bil'am wanted to protect the city, build a wall. So he comes closer to the wall, and instead of a greeting hello, he gets barrages of arrows, stones, fire. They're like bombarding them from inside. Now he says, wait a minute, I have to now uh, uh, conquer my own, my own city, my own land. Any attempt that he did failed. And every time they want to come close, dozens and hundreds of his men died. He went into the water, they all drowned. He went closer, the snakes bit them all. As the king was about to lose hope and say, okay, I will, uh, that's it, I am going to lose my mamlacha. The interesting here, the, the interesting thing is that when you read it in the Midrash, you think this is an event that took a month. The Midrash says it took nine years. The king of Kush was locked out of his kingdom for nine years while Bil'am is running the show, doing whatever he wants there, and he's outside. Okay, Moshe Rabbeinu came and got uh, friendly with uh, this uh, king, Kokus, and he told him, uh, listen, uh, this is, it's a very easy to get into the city. Anyways, Moshe Rabbeinu became friendly, somehow he put a lot of trust in Moshe Rabbeinu's hands, and he came with an announcement and he says, this is I'm about to die. I'm giving over the control to this young man. I believe he can get you into the city. The day after the king dies, they make a lot of uh, ceremonies and monuments, blah, blah, blah. And okay, now to business. Moshe Rabbeinu says, listen to me, I can get you into the city tomorrow. Okay, what do you want us to do? Moshe Rabbeinu tells them, I want you to go and get to me thousands of storks. You know those, uh, the, the, the bird that people think, they tell the, the brings the babies, get me, I need a lot of storks. Don't ask any questions, just get me what I told you. Okay, they brought the storks, 
And then Moshe Rabbeinu tell, told the people, starve them. Put them in cages, let them be starving for two, three days. Okay, they starve the sorts. Then the next day, when they're ready, Moshe Rabbeinu says, okay, now you take all the sorts out. And what are we going to do with them? They come close to the city and they release all the storks who are starving and they go down and grab all the snakes from their little uh, holes because they have a long beak and they take all the snakes and the hundreds and thousands of storks kill all the snakes. And then they're able to get in and Moshe Rabbeinu, uh, uh, with different maneuvers, able to chick, chick, chick and they pe penetrate it into the city. Okay. And of course conquered it, kicked out Bilam and uh, his kids, who fled, and everybody was happy, and uh, they uh, honored Moshe Rabbeinu to be their king. So Moshe Rabbeinu becomes the king of Kush. Now, he becomes the, the, the how do you say, the first man? So they told him, you need a first lady. Now, the wife of the ex-king is now, you know, a widow. So they matched him with her. Now, here comes a problem. She wasn't uh, Jewish. And not only that, if you look at the history of Kush, they're descendants of Ham. And Noach cursed Ham. And Moshe Rabbeinu says, I don't want to marry her. So he pretended that they're married. He rules the land, and he pretends that he's married to her, and everything is uh, okay. Forty years, Moshe Rabbeinu is the king of Kush. No questions asked. One day, after forty years, the wife of uh, uh, the ex-wife of the king and the wife, new wife, supposedly of Moshe Rabbeinu, calls the ca cabinet the, of the king, the king kingdom, and tells them, "Listen, you know this Moshe. You know we're not really married." And uh, he, doesn't, he doesn't live with me. And not only that, he doesn't believe in our gods. He doesn't bow to our gods. He, I don't know what he prays for. And he does weird things, and he's really not one of us. And, you know, just that you know, we're not married. The whole 40 years we weren't together. They were, the, the committee there was very unhappy, but nevertheless they were very grateful for what Moshe Rabbeinu did, so they decided instead of punishing him or doing something bad, just to tell him, you know, just, just be quiet. Okay, and that was agreed by all sides, and Moshe Rabbeinu quietly leaves Kush, and happens to be, you know, skipping a lot of details, and on his way away from Kush, he comes to Midian, now what happens is that the girls of uh, uh, Yitro, they come to their father and they say, there's a man here who just ran away from Kush. And they tell him a little bit about the story. Right away, Yitro was like, really? Yitro was for years trying to get diplomatic relations with the kingdom of Kush, and now he has the opportunity. Because he says, if Moshe Rabbeinu ran from Kush, who runs from Kush? You know what I mean? Why would you run away from Kush? It's like me saying, well, why, what? if you live in, I don't know, well, Boca Raton, Beverly Hills, you don't run away from there. You know, if you're sitting with millions and everything is great, why would you run away? So he says, if he ran away from Kush, he's, he must have done something against the government and they're after him. So sooner or later, they'll come to catch him. So what did Moitro do? He threw Moshe in jail. And he says, I'll let you go when they come to take you. And I'll bargain. That will be my, my, my bargaining uh, uh, card. They want you. I want diplomatic relations with them. Take Moshe Rabbeinu in the relations. The problem is that the people from Kush they didn't care about Moshe Rabbeinu. They let him go and they forgot about him. So they never came. And Moshe ended up sitting in jail for 10 years. 10 years it all locked Moshe in prison. And later on you wonder what honor he gave him when he came to him in the desert. I don't know if uh, <laughs> I would uh, treat this man so nice 
after he put me in jail for 10 years. And this is not jail that you have TVs and you make yourself a diploma. It was a holy ground. The Milash says that Tzipor used to go there and throw him food all the time. Talk to him, be with him. 10 years! One day he came to his senses and says, I don't think they're coming. I don't think they're coming. And, and not only that, he realized something's very special with this man. Who lives in jail in, the, in, a, in a hole in the ground for 10 years, no complaining, no in the, trying to escape. What's going on here? He all figured out something is uh, uh, more than meets the eye, took him out of jail, apologized, which only Moshe Rabbeinu can say, eh, no problem. <laughs> Totally fine. I needed the break. <laughs> uh, only Moshe Rabbeinu can be like, sure, no problem. And then, of course, you know the story that he told gave Tzipora to Moshe. And by the way, this is not a, a, it was idea. Rather, the Zohar says that I'm sure you heard me say not once and not twice that when Cain and Heaven were born, they were born with twins. Heaven was born with two twins, girls, and Cain was born with one twin girl. Another motive for the murder. Because he got two women and I only got one woman. So he got jealous and one of the many reasons why Cain uh, killed Heaven. Nevertheless, each one got twins. Tzipora was the Gilgul, the incarnation of Heaven's twin, which was the Shidduch of Moshe Rabbeinu, who was Heaven. So Moshe Rabbeinu, I mean, Heaven came with a twin to marry her and procreate, and same with Cain. How do you think they all, the whole system started? The Moshe Rabbeinu was supposed to marry Tzipora when they were heaven and whatever her name is. The Zohar says a few names, but there's no uh, uh, source. I mean, the Zohar says names, but nevertheless, Moshe Rabbeinu was supposed to marry Tzipora already in the previous incarnation, then therefore they got together. And uh, what else? The story is much, much longer. I just don't want to, to, to go too much. But let me, let, let me finish the story here that Moshe Rabbeinu ended up in Midian and needless to say, married Zipporah and eventually, uh, you know the whole story that uh, was a uh, revelation by Hashem and he became the Redeemer. But we have a little bit of an overview that what happened to Moshe between 18 to 80. So we already know that when he ran away to Kush, he didn't come to Kush right away. There's more questions, because if the battle between the king of Kush and Bil'am was nine years, till Moshe Rabbeinu came and took over, so Moshe Rabbeinu was somewhere for nine years, right? That we don't know, unless uh, I'm sure there's still uh, maybe a sore summer. It's the same thing with Yaakov, they went down to Haran, he stopped, oh, by the way, he stopped for only 14 years in, in, here in Shem Ever. So, oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you, a minor stop, 14 years he sat in Yeshiva. Same thing with Moshe, he disappeared somewhere for nine years and then came to, to Kush. You can start calculating the years. He was already, obviously, he became king uh, of Kush around 27, 28, right? 18 plus the nine years. Every give or take a few months, so he became the king of Kush around 28, add on that 40 years, that's 68, add on that 10 years in jail, that's 78. There you have it, he married Sipol, two kids, and went down to Mitzrayim. The whole uh, time timeline starts spinning better. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to stop here now, there are many more uh, interesting sources about the life of Moshe and so many other things, but uh, I want to know, and I want you to know, why Moshe Rabbeinu was not allowed to be buried in Eretz Israel? Not the entering of Eretz Israel. The, the Holy Script says something very powerful. That Moshe Rabbeinu did not get to be buried in Eretz Israel because for 40 years it looked like he's married to that woman. He didn't marry her. He didn't touch her. Didn't have kids with her. Nothing. But it looked like he was married to her. That was enough. That was the reason why he wasn't allowed to be buried in Islam. Now one might ask, what? And the answer would be, yeah. That just goes to show you the level of Moshe Rabbeinu. Because when we talking about Moshe Rabbeinu, we think, okay, it's another man probably with a long beard and very wise. 
Moshe Rabbeinu was not a person that we can relate with. He's not a person that you can say, oh, it's a regular man. He's not a regular man. Not in regards to uh, that he spoke to God and brought the Torah down to the world and brought the Jews out of the time and many things. His reactions were not human. Because any normal person would not take such a thing by saying, Are you kidding me? I gave now 40 years of my life to this nation for one little minor thing and being punished like that. That's not cool. That's nonsense. So any other person would be like, what? I just gave 40 years of my life and I can't even get the minimum of the minimum. I did something minor and that is it. It just goes to show us the level of Moshe Laben. The Torah says, Vaishaya Anav Mikol, he was the most humble person ever. Just go look in your life to bad news that you got, something that you really felt you did not deserve, something in your life. Each and every one of you can find one time in your life that you are extremely disappointed in God because you felt that something that you deserve it and you didn't get it. Whether it was a woman you wanted to marry, a business that you wanted to start, whatever. And then when it doesn't happen, you get upset. You get upset. Why? It's not fair. Not too long ago, you met a, met a young man. And he's not so young, actually. He's in his uh, mid-50s. Who did tshuva, and for 15 years, he can't uh, uh, find his other half. He came to me all oh, angry, angry. He's like, what is this for? He, was, he took a tzitzit and threw it. He was like, what is this for? I wear tzitzit, I do tshuva for 15 years, and I can't even have a wife. What am I asking? He was so upset. He was like, I, I, you know, I guard my eyes, guard my mouth, guard my breath. I do everything. What am I asking? Now, what are you talking to such a, just a, such a person? And what am I going to tell him? Some stupid slogan, everything will be okay. No, any ushba olam. You need to make a vessel. And he doesn't want to hear that. He wants to hear, I am demanding. And I, I can understand. So you go find in your, in, your, in your history the time that you've been disappointed like that, then you'll understand the level of Moshe Rabbein. Knowing when to say, ah, oh, no, okay, your decision. Moshe Rabbein was in such a high level that he, he taught us something way, before, way beyond what we think. Moshe Rabbeinu asked us to remember him. And what does it mean that he asked us to remember him? Moshe Rabbeinu prayed 515 prayers to get into the land of Israel. And in the end, he didn't get in. What does it say about Moshe Rabbeinu? What does he say about himself? I knew how to accept the no. Can you imagine the level? That's where we look at Moshe Rabbeinu and we have to understand his level. And more than that, that is going to give us the inspiration. And at least if not the inspiration, then the clarity. Moshe Rabbeinu was fine with no. Now, when the no is not such a big thing, but when the no is the biggest thing that you want in this world and you don't get it, you get disappointed with Hashem. You get angry, you might throw things around and you might not do any more mitzvot. Because you're angry. Esther, who also her Hilula uh, today, did the same thing. She uh, was self-sacrificed, went and lived with uh, Ahasuerus in his house, in the palace, for years. And for what? She could have said, who needs this headache? I'll go take care of myself. She did it for the entire nation. The Midrash says that uh, uh, Esther used to cry every night to Sarah, our matriarch, saying, you got abducted to the house of Paul. You, you screamed, you sh shook the heavens that night, and the next day you were released. How, how come I have to be with this uh, monster? Esther did the same thing. It was for the nations. Okay, so I have to suffer. I have to suffer for the... For everybody else. And in, in our personal life, each and every one of us, when I go through my suffering, 
It's for everybody else, not only for me. The suffering that I encounter, it doesn't matter right now what it is, it's balancing the entire world. So, we see that many of the great leaders of uh, the nation of Israel, that was their thing, is to, to give away their, their, their soul with, with great self-sacrifice to do for the sake of the nation. And Moshe Rabbeinu, of course, is one of them. Is if not the one of them, is the biggest of all of them. Now, what Moshe Rabbeinu did is to let go of his honor. And that already went down for Esther, the queen, and many other sages. But when you want to see the greatness of Moshe Rabbeinu, it's not the fact that he was the greatest prophet ever. Because God decides who's going to be a prophet. You can be a prophet if God wants. So if God wants you to be a big prophet, like Moshe Rabbeinu, he'll make you. So that's the greatest greatness of God, not the greatness of Moshe Rabbeinu. He was a great leader, a great uh, scholar, a great teacher. All this is because God gave it to him. And Moshe Rabbeinu says on himself, I'm not that great. If, if the job was given to you, you'd probably do better than me. What was great about Moshe Rabbeinu is his, his reactions, his inner work, his understanding of who he is and where, what's his place. And even Moshe Rabbeinu is nothing in, compared to God. And when God says no, Moshe Rabbeinu puts his hand down. That's it. Moshe Rabbeinu you know, to put his honor aside. And that's something that all of us don't know how to do, to put your honor aside. Now, it's very easy to put your honor aside when the situation is very easy. But when somebody's coming at you and attacking you or using you or hurting you or slandering you or, 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 you're not going to be so nice. You're not going to find so many places in your heart to be like, oh, okay. Moshe Rabbeinu knew who he was. He knew to put his honor away for the sake of Shemayim. He knew that when he messed up, to admit, okay, I messed up. Moshe Rabbeinu did something that gave us the power that if you pay attention, we are going now in the month of Adar. We're going to read now very soon Parashat Tetzaveh. The entire month of Adar, the energy of a month of Adar is to do one very important mitzvah. Machot imchet amalek. Right? That's really, I don't, I'm not talking about Purim. Purim has its own mitzvah. During the Dab, we have the opportunity to fulfill the mitzvah that it says in the Torah, you shall uh, obliterate, obliterate the remembrance of Amalek. Amen. That's the mitzvah that we need to do. That's the time, the month of Adar is the month to be able to overpower Amalek. Now, what is really the, the prudding of Amalek? Killing a person? Killing a nation? Do you know who Amalek is? I mean, we have a good uh, idea who they are. I mean, I don't know, maybe somewhere in Aza. Oh, I don't know, Nazis. I mean, we can kind of uh, uh, imagine. Uh, ISIS. Uh, 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 forms of life in a shape of a human that can behave like they behave. That's, that's an Amalek. Kind of a person's head. So we have an idea of who's Amalek, but what are we going to do? How, how do you destroy Amalek? So of course there are many angles how to destroy the Amalek, but let's concentrate on something today. In the Zchut of Moshe Rabbeinu. Amalek is written Ein Mem Lamed Kuf. Amalek. If you take away the Kuf, it brings you the word Amal. Amal is labor or to toil. When you toil to become a better person, to do the mitzvot, to fight your inclination, to guard your eyes, guard your mouth, when you put a lot of effort, what are you expecting? Some feedback, some reward, something. The problem is that most of our effort goes to the klipot. Because if the klipot means the, the other side of holiness, the... The, the manifestation of all evil. Most of us, by the way, feed the clipot. Because you wake up in the morning, you pray, 
you eat, you say a blessing, you give charity, you learn Torah, you put filin, you, you do so many mitzvot, and all it takes is one line of Lashon Hara, all your mitzvot went to the klipa. You lost all your mitzvot. So who does it go to? Amalek. Your Amal, Ayn, Mem, Lamed, your toil, your effort, who does it go to? To the klipot? You get Amalek. So you're feeding Amalek. We are feeding our enemy, by the way. The enemy that is coming on top of us to try to destroy us, it's our sins that creates that. Give it power and life. So Moshe Rabbeinu's main, uh, 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 how would he say it, uh, inheritance, because he left us many things, but he left us the power of overpowering Amalek, that my Amal should go to the right place. Why should I put so much effort into something and it doesn't bear any fruit? So Moshe Rabbeinu left us so many things to, 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 Use as tools to better ourselves. And why? To look at Moshe Rabbeinu. Now, we say a verse every day. It depends. Uh, some of you will find it familiar in the prayer of Aleinu Shabbat three times a day. But there's a verse in the book of Yeshayahu, chapter 65, verse 21, that it says, Translation, they shall not toil in vain and Loni Lelabella should not uh, uh, fall into uh, anxiety and fear. This is a verse from Ishaya. We mentioned that in Aleinu Shabbat, a little bit different words, but that's what we're praying for. Sheloni Galarik, everything, Rik means emptiness, that I should not uh, put effort for nothing. Rik means emptiness. The Sheloni Lelabella, and if you're Shalom, I give my energy to the clipboard. That's where people get all these fears and anxieties that people are just taking over them. So, Moshe Rabbeinu <clears throat> left us the power that my Amal, my Torah, should go to be, should, should be fruitful. How? By overpowering Amalek. How do you overpower the Amalek? That I, I focus that where my effort goes to. And it doesn't go to nonsense. Pay attention and you'll see how much effort you put to things that don't need the effort. And the things that need effort and attention, you neglect. That's the sad reality. Put your effort and your time to pray, to learn Torah, to do the mitzvot, not to your business and to everything else. That will fall. But once you put your effort into one mitzvot, the Kanoj will make everything come in like that. So let's go back to uh, what we were talking about before is that Moshe Rabbeinu, first of all, like I told you, gives us the power to fight Amalek. He's the one who went to the war against Amalek. But Moshe Rabbeinu also left us this power that if you tap into it, you will get to the point that you are able to accept the no. And again, there's only one way of doing it. Look into your own past. I can't tell you about yourself. I can tell you about my, myself the times that I didn't accept the no. How many times did Hashem said no to what you wanted? Now go and cycle and say, like, uh, 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 analyze it. How, how did you react then? Did you accept it and say, okay. That you can say yes for very minor things. I will be very, very uh, impressed if you are one of the people who tell me, ah, Hashem can restore my life and say thank you for everything. And I had a few of these. But we're talking about you know, people like us, like normal people. Then when God slams the door into your face, you feel the... So we're going to focus very soon on the fact of why the accepting the no is a great virtue. Now how do you do that? That can only come from anava. Anava, humility, only when you're true, true humble to Hashem, then you will accept everything that Hashem gives you. As horrible as it is, and unfortunately, people have to face Hashem Elohim, death of their child, sometimes two or three. How many parents now on October 7th bury two or three children at the same time? You know, I mean, people go through tragedies that I, I, I don't even know how to start digesting. 
The majority don't understand that this is also the hand of Hashem. Moshe was able to reach to the level that he understood that's the hand of Hashem, and he was able to say, okay, that's what Hashem wants. I can, I can argue. So before we finish, I want to uh, share with you a very interesting so story that happened to me two weeks ago. And I think that's the highlight to put all the points together. And the story came in such a shgacha pratit that I, I knew I'm going to have to share it at some point, but let me think when I'm going to share it, and tonight, tonight is the perfect time. So, a few weeks ago, not even, maybe two weeks ago, I went somewhere uh, to pick up something in the center of Israel, but when I called the person to make the order, uh, of course, he asked me my name. I mean, you don't make an order without a name. So, what's your first name? Alon. What's your last name? Anava. Excuse me, really? That's your last name? That's it? He's like, wow, what a beautiful last name. And you know what it means. And he goes on a 10-minute on a rant, what the Anava means. And uh, I don't know who the guy is. And he gives me all the phone, like, real interesting, beautiful twists of the Torah, of the name, and this, and I'm actually listening. I'm going to order something and I'm getting a Shul Torah. <laughs> and uh, then he tells me, you know, to reach to a level of Anava, that's very, very, a very hard level to reach a level of Anava, but you know, who cannot be touched by the Samech Mem, Tzadik, Samech Mem is the, the acronym or the short name of the Satan, Samech Mem Aleph, his name is, you write it, Samech Mem Aleph Lam. But uh, <coughs> so I said, okay, he told me, who, who can uh, the Samech Mem cannot touch? I said, a Tzadik, no, they, no. So I told him, who? He tells me, a person that has true anava. And I was like, okay, wh wh where are you bringing this? What, what's the connection? So he tells me, what's the numerical value of the word anava? 131. What's the numerical value of the Samech Mem's name, Samech Mem Malik 131. Only a person with true humility can overpower the Samech Mem. That's Moshe Rabbeinu. When you reach the true anava, the Samech Mem can't touch you. Now, a few days later, after he tells me that, I'm like, wow. A few days later, I come to his store, I do the order, and we meet, and we talk, and, and as we're talking, he, he somehow got it out of me, and I was like, no, oh, I wasn't born religious. And he was like, ah, you Jose Bichuva? I said, yeah. So I sent him, I show him a picture how I looked. He was like, what? And then I told him, yeah, I, uh, 20 plus years ago, I, 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 I had a cardiac arrest from a drug overdose and I had a near-death experience. I was clinically dead for seven minutes. So he went and saw just a few minutes of the clip. The funny thing was that I came into the, to the uh, it wasn't a store, like uh, wherever it was. Within a few minutes, I had like a circle of 15 people around me and I'm telling them the story of my life. So, as I'm telling these people the story of my life, then he goes and watches on his phone, uh, starts watching the, my lecture, then he comes back and he tells me, look at that, you called me a few days ago, I don't know who you are, and you tell me Anava, and I'm still telling you about the whole name of Anava, and then I finalize by telling you, you know, who, who's untouchable, who the Samach men cannot touch, a person that has Anava. And now you're coming to me and you're telling me the Samach man wasn't able to touch you. He's like, he, he, was, he was so blown away. But I was like, huh. Now I don't know if that's really was the case 20 plus years ago. But that's very, de definitely something to think about. The Samach man can't touch you if you're really humble. If you're really humble and you're humble to, the, to Hashem, you reach to such a level of humility that if you follow the teachings of Nachmanides in the letter of Nachmanides, he tells you, humble yourself, you humble yourself, the more you humble yourself, that's how high God will take you. So if you're not going high, you're not so humble. 
And you know, how far you go? And the Kadosh Baruch will raise you to levels that you didn't even dream that you can reach. And it doesn't need publication. You don't need to walk with a sign of your humble Hashem took me to a high level. It's between you and Hashem. That's part of the component of being humble. It's not going around the streets and I'm the greatest thing ever. We take from here such a powerful thing that Moshe Rabbeinu went and he reverse engineered the system. Right? Instead of going full force against a force that you can't, he went around and he humbled himself. Therefore, he was able to accept the no. He was able to reach your levels. He understood. Do I have to say here? I prayed 550 times. That didn't work. Should I uh, 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 quit? Should I fall into uh, depression? Should I fall into despair? No. That's what was needed to give. And obviously the 550 uh, prayers that I did had to go to somewhere else. And I accept with love what Hashem gave me. So uh, unfortunately, uh, I, I know I told you, we started that we're dedicating the class to the elevation of the soul, this young baby, and for the menuchat nefesh this serenity in the heart, peace in the heart for this lovely friend of ours. But you see how sometimes a person can go through such a tragedy and to rise up from the depth and from the, the bottom of the where you can reach by understanding that's what Hashem wanted. That's the tikkun of this baby. You know, it says that the Zohar says about Moshe Rabbeinu that while Batya took him, she, nobody was able to feed him. Everyone that they tried to feed Moshe Rabbeinu put his head away. Why? It's not Chalav Israel. It's not kosher. There's no all you on the, you know, the Batya. He looked at it. Nah. The Zohar says the same mouth that there was future to give prophecies, cannot drink milk of a mother that is not his original or Jewish. So Moshe Rabbeinu, even as a baby, no? I told you many times, Moshe Rabbeinu should have been called Moshe Hanavi, right? Moshe the prophet. No come can a vikim Moshe. But greater than all of them, so why did Eliyahu get the Navi and Shmuel got the Navi? And Zechari and Nechezkel, Moshe should have gotten it. But Moshe went one level above, not one, a hundred levels above a prophet, and Navi means a prophet. He reached to the level already of beyond a, a prophet. He reached to the level of Anava. Now, Anavai Rebbe, we wish to reach one little piece, but nevertheless, he was named Rabbeinu, our teacher, because we need to look, that's the, the, the image to look at. And Moshe Rabbeinu is coming and telling us, I'm human like you. The same way I was able to do it, you are going to be able to do it. You just need to draw the right energy, the right power to do it. And therefore, we are sitting here today. Because what more of a better day in the month of Purim, the month of Adar, that the nature of the month of Adar is to turn everything completely the other way. Benafokhu. I can tell you that in the last month of Adar Aleph, we're just a little bit in Adar bit. In Adar Aleph, you can't even imagine the focus I experienced in my life. You can't even imagine the miracles that you, you, you don't even imagine. That I was like, okay, Adar, let's let the boss do his thing. And we still have another Adar to go. I'm telling you everything that it says. You have a legal issue, this is a good month to go to court. Everything was fixed that I needed to fix. Unbelievable. It's a very powerful month. Now we're taking the component of a very powerful day that gives us the energy, because what is the energy of the day? The teaching, the Moshe Rabbeinu. The ability to reach to a level of an Ava that I can accept the no of Hashem. So much more so if I accept the no of Hashem, I'll accept the no of anyone. That really shows you, that reflects the humility, that I don't need your approval. Somebody told me the other day, oh, you know, in one of your last lectures, you said something very hurtful, and you said, I don't care what you think about me. I said, why is that hurtful? That's the truth. I don't care what you think about me. I care what God thinks about me. 
I am not here to try to impress you in any type of way. Not how I dress, not how I talk, not with the Torah I teach. My uh, uh, level of impressing is God. So therefore, don't take it in the, in the wrong way. Therefore, the definition is that I don't really care what you think. I care what Hashem thinks. Because what if you think it's okay for me to testify Shabbat? Like some of my relatives. I need to think like you. No, I think like what God thinks. And many people attack me with the, what they think I should think. No, no, no. Don't try to throw me your opinions. My opinion is only the Torah opinion. So I don't care what you think. Don't get me wrong. It's not that I totally ignore people. And I don't, what it means is I don't care if you are uh, approving how I dress or how I talk or who I talk to or where I pray or what I do with my life. Some people have their life. It's like, what, what will people say? Oh, I can't go there. So-and-so is there. I can't do this because she said that. And... So you care about what people think about you. Of course, it has to be in a good balance. You don't you can't just mistreat people and step all over them. What I'm saying is that I care only what the Kadosh Baruch thinks. I'm, I care to be good with him. If I'm good with Hashem, the Mishnah says, Kol ruach makom no no. I forgot the name, I forgot the, the term. As long as Hashem is happy with you, the people down here are happy with you. And if people are not happy with you in this world, you have two options. Either you're doing so great that you have to have some enemies, or that you're not as great as you think. And you're not doing as great as you might think that you are. I mean, natural when people don't like you, dislike you. Nevertheless, uh, to conclude, we have a very, very powerful opportunity. I've posted on my website a few things that one can do, should do. And if you didn't do it yet, still do it. I posted on my website a certain order of Tehillim that needs to be read. Uh, 11 uh, chapters of Tehillim from Tzadik to Kuf, uh, with Patach uh, Eliyahu and another piece from the Zohar. Uh, that's from the sources that I take and that's what I did. There are a few other things because uh, this day is a very powerful day uh, specifically for things that don't go in the right manner like we spoke about. In the power of Adal, the Nafok, the transformation, specifically on this day. So when somebody has some type of an issue, today is a very good day to uh, appeal to the master of the universe. So there is uh, one uh, 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 teaching that one should read chapter 24, 22, Kavbet of Tehilim, seven times. And then read uh, Shirat Ayam, Azashir Moshe, seven times. And then to say Moshe Rabbeinu seven times, and then to play whatever you have with the Kadosh Mokho. If you want, you can do that. It's, I think, a little bit shorter than what I put on my website. My website, it's 11 uh, chapters of Tehillim. Some of them are longer. Plus the Petach Eliyahu, plus the, part, the portion of the Zohar. If you can, read everything. I read whatever I can. Uh, you know, here, you, the more you add, the better. So if you haven't done it yet, especially the live people online that are in the uh, United States or anywhere, uh, uh, west of Israel, and you still have uh, Zion now. By us, it's already uh, eight in the evening at thirty. So please, still do it. You must do it. You want to take advantage of this powerful, powerful day. So, and again, and by the way, there are many other beautiful uh, uh, commentaries. Not commentaries. I don't even know how to to really call it but great sages that explain what they do on uh, Zayn Adah. Because you have to understand, Zayn Adah is a very powerful day. You know, normally, Zayn Adah, Meron should be packed. Today, you know, I'm live, so I, I got to, I can't say too much, really. But uh, somebody was very, uh, uh, someone, somebody, somewhere, wanted no one to come to Meron today. Why have 50,000 people praying in Zion now? Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is a spark of an incarnation of Ron Moshe Rabbeinu. That's why I uh, suggested to go. But what I'm saying is that the day is so powerful. So powerful that if we would get together in a place like Meron, needless to say it would be as powerful as Lagba Omer. But 
there's a very uh, interesting, uh, and again, it's not commentary, it's just a little quote a recommendation about what to do today, is that uh, uh, read what I told you, chapter 22, and as a shield, but then to read chapter 91 seven times. Okay? Chapter 91, you should have said that Why? That's a great Mikubal says that if you need a salvation, some huge change in your life, then read chapter 91 seven times. And when you get to the end, to the end chapter, there's a word, Asbi'eu ve'ar'ehu. Okay, the translation is, I will let him live to rip old age and show him my salvation. Right. When you get to these two words, then you want to uh, uh, meditate on Asbi'ehu, uh, I will, uh, the translation, I will live to him to rip old age. Right. Huh? Right. Right. But asbi'ehu means I will nourish him and to fulfill. You know, sova means that I'm full. When I'm, I'm going to eat and I'm full, it's called sova. Asbi'ehu, I will make you... you nothing's going to be missing. Ve'ar'ehu yeshuati, and I'll show him my salvation. Read the chapter of Tehilim seven times and uh, 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 meditate on the words and you'll understand why you're reading it if you really need the salvation. Chapter 91... You read when you need help in a uh, in bad situation uh, at any time. When, uh, when I, uh, you know, not too long ago I was driving fast, uh, I was in a rush, and, uh, and a police car came after me. And I was like, wait, that's, that's not a good thing. So I started saying this more uh, uh, Tzadik Aleph, Yeshiva Seter Leon, seven times. And again, I'm not, uh, I marked the video not appropriate for kids, but don't try that at home, okay? I was driving very fast. And, uh, and the police car went after me, but I believe in the power of the, uh, reading the Tilim. Now I said it off my heart. I didn't read the, uh, as I was driving, I, so I, I was saying it off my heart. But what happened was that cars, the police car went uh, not too fast. There were cars in front of me and he was trying to pass them and they were kind of blocking him from getting to me. And after I finished my seventh Tehillim, and I'm seeing the whole thing in the, in the mirror. It takes me the Tehillim to read 25 seconds. Three minutes, I read the whole thing. He was blocked by other cars that he ended up pulling over somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like... So this uh, chapter of Tehillim has a lot of power. It comes uh, after the chapter of uh, the chapter of Tehillim of Moshe Rabbeinu. But nevertheless, use this day. It's a powerful, powerful day for prayer that you should pray for yourself or many others to be able to reach your level of humility that even the no and the slamming doors in your face that God sometimes does, that you know how to accept it. To bring you to a place that you are humble enough that the master of the universe elevates you. That you are humble enough to reach to a level that whatever God does for you, you accept it. So today you have a day that you have the opportunity to focus, to meditate on the prayers, to give some charity in the zchut of Moshe Rabbeinu, to uh, 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 create yourself a good vessel, but take advantage of the day. Most people who look, they nod, and they, they, they do nothing. But it's, uh, like, like, like I told you, a Black Friday. Ironically, many people, when they see the videos that I'm saying today is a special day, people have the question, what, and not, every day is not special? What, I can't pray every day to Hashem? I can't do tshuva any day? Now, of course you can, every day is special. But uh, in auspicious days, whether you like it or not, there are some days that the Shefa, you have to understand the entire structure of the world above, the spiritual world, is what the teachings of Kabbalah says, it's all uh, uh, rings, and uh, I mean, the word in, in, in Hebrew is igulim. How translated to a ring? Because igul is like a ring, you call it a circle. And now not the time to uh, explain what it means, but everything in Shemaim is in the form of surrounding each other, everything is rings to each other. So, the same way that the abundance, the shepherd comes down to the world, 
it has many channels how it comes down to the world. The, the, the fact is that we see days on the history there were bad days, and days in the history there were good days. And that's how the Kadosh Baruch Hu is, uh, is uh, controlling the cycle. So what I would love to leave you with is uh, a blessing that in the merit of Moshe Rabbeinu on this holy day and in the merit of this powerful month of Adal, days before Purim, where years ago we were on the verge of annihilation and uh, the mercy of Hashem, after we as a nation figured it out, that the key here is first of all to be united and after we are united to value our talk why? I'm sure you know the Midrash it says that what did Mordechai do? there was an annihilation can you imagine? Out, out, uh, tomorrow we're going to destroy the Jews Hitler didn't even announce it Amman announced it Mordechai took kids into a huge room, thousands and thousands of kids, and started making them uh, chant words of Torah. Why? Because the mouth of a child is pure. It doesn't have any sins. So uh, the prayer of a child is much purer. Then, you know, there are 13 principles in the Torah that if you want to be called somewhat of a student, you need to know these 13 principles. And one of the principles is learning something from something. Right? What do you see here? What did Mordechai do? He said something very powerful. Of course, not to the nation. When I was looking at different stories to tell you about Moshe Rabbeinu and the Midrash, so I found a different Midrash. Midrash Tenchuma. One sentence that I wanted to make that lecture on, but then I decided to make the lecture on this topic. And it says there that Moshe Rabbeinu addressed the people when he came to Mitzrayim and he told them, the ones who did live Mitzrayim, you don't have the merit to be redeemed because you taught Roshon Ara. That's what Moshe Rabbeinu told them. And saying, in other words, if you reverse engineer it, you taught Roshon Ara. You're not going to have a chance to be redeemed. That's it. It's not that if you talk Lashon Ara, then you won't be redeemed. It's the other way around. If you talk, then you're not going to be redeemed. So Moshe Rabbeinu's emphasis, and you have to understand that throughout the career of Moshe Rabbeinu, how much Lashon Ara was talked about him. Even by his own sister. And many others, like Korach and Datan and Abiram, and many, many others talked Lashon Ara about Moshe Rabbeinu, and not once there was a reaction. Never that he reacted. He always bowed down to the master of the universe, not to the person in front of him. So Moshe Rabbeinu knew how to uh, uh, lower himself. He knew how to minimize himself. Bezad Hashem, not so simple, but with the merit of this holy day and the merit of Moshe Rabbeinu and our prayers, that we should be blessed all to be able to uh, bring ourselves to a place of humility that I can see the hand of Hashem in, in everything. We are in a very powerful week where you can switch everything with the energy of Purim and Afoho. Just imagine what we can do in this week. I mean, history repeats itself. I told you already that the book of Kohelet, written by King Solomon, Shlomo Melech, what does he say? I said that three, four years ago, maybe 5,000 times, not Enel Bin Vado. I said another thing that I kept repeating all the time. And Mashaya, oh, yeah. I told you that. That was our slogan. What was is what's going to be. Interestingly, in the name of Moshe Rabbeinu, you see the hint to that. Because Moshe is Mem Shin Hei, Ma Shehaya, Hu Moshe Rabbeinu is telling us everything is a is a cycle. So we have to understand that Masha'ya Ushu'ya, Moshe Rabbeinu, is the one who instructs us what to do. But we're living already in the time when one can do tshuva. All you need to do is take another seven days from Zion and to, to Purim and to really work on yourself. To pray to the Kadosh Bokhu to bless you with true humility that you'll be able to grow, that you'll be able to uh, spread the light in the world. And one of the most important things is to learn what Mordechai did to get us out of the problem. He made sure that nobody's talking. 
or what Moshe Rabbeinu says, you talk to Shonara, you don't have a zchut to be redeemed. So we have a little bit of a problem, because a lot of people don't know how to control their mouth. So what I would suggest is to focus on these three things that we've talked about today, is A, uh, guarding your mouth, B, finding the place in your heart and uh, humble yourself, and the third one is to accept the no, to move away your honor, to move away your respect, to move away that I need to be number one, I need to get the honor, I need to get the respect and the attention, and to understand somebody else, it's their time. The year it's only should be a will of the Kadosh who should bless us all with great happiness, true happiness in our hearts, mm -hmm. that we should learn to love Hashem, love other, other people, oversee their faults, even though they're coming at us with the horrible things, it's still messengers of Hashem. We should have the will. Hashem's will should be to bless us. Our heart should be open. That our heart should be open to pursue Torah and follow our Master. Look at the life of our Master, of Dr. Moshe Rabbeinu, and say, that's what he's supposed to teach me. He's not teaching me Chumash. He's not teaching me Gemara. He's teaching me how to conduct his life. I mean, in one way, Moshe is the king. He's the number one citizen in the world. He's a prophet. He's everything. He's a rich millionaire. So you would expect him to have an ego out of control. But why was he so amazed, so successful? Only because of his humility. Because other shame should all merit to true humility, true happiness, that we should all merit to see the coming of Mashiach very soon and should merit to see the resurrection of our first Redeemer, Moshe Rabbeinu. And Bezat Hashem, in this holy day, take the energy now for seven days. Seven days, the energy is strong till Purim. And Purim is the peak of when you can do your tshuva. And don't forget, like what I told many times, Tu Bishvat is the beginning of the redemption. It jumps a month to Purim. This year it's a leap year, we have double. But it's all on the 14th, the 14th of, uh, 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 of, uh, the, of each month, it's the preparation. But the 15th, Tu Bishvat, Purim is on the 15th. Let's say on the 15th, that's when it happens. It's, a st it's stages that we have to go through. You want to reach your personal redemption in a month and a week, in the Pesach? Your personal redemption doesn't mean the whole world gets redeemed. You get redeemed from your own, your own knots. You get redeemed from your own the problems you have in your mind, emotional, physical, mental, financial. That's Pesach. Now, I can only talk from my own experience. I cannot tell on other people. I, I can tell you for the last 22 years from experience how it actually works. And that I see how it unfolds in front of me. I'm telling you the last month and a week. The whole month of Adar, now is not the time. I will share another day. Miracles that you can't even think to what magnitude, all because of Adar. And of course you have to be a uh, battle, you have to be a nullified to the situation, not to go head first. So take this powerful day, schlep it another seven days to, to Purim, celebrate Purim the right way, like I told you in the meeting, go to read the Purim guide, it tells you exactly what you need to do, when to do the Machatzit Shekel, what to do in the fast, what to meditate on the fast, why we're fasting, all the mitzvot you need to do, Mechiyat Amalek, listen to the Torah, all the mitzvot and Purim, don't miss it, I mean there's so many things to do. All the links are in the description. Everything that I, uh, uh, that I uh, refer to, you can find the links in the description. And I will not leave you, but still say uh, thank you for your patience and I wish you all a uh, uh, happy pouring if I don't talk to you in person. And in, if I don't see you until then, then happy Pesach. For the ones of you online that are in New York, New Jersey or Miami, I, you better come to the... I don't want to hear that I came all the way to New York and you had something else to do. <laughs> so, uh, I'm expecting to see you all and I want you to share it with everyone. We're going to start now advertising uh, the tour much more enhanced. Please, if you're planning on coming, Ours between the link below so we can know how many people are coming. I'm telling you, it's going to be an event that you do not want to miss. I saw somebody wrote uh, on Facebook, they shared the, the flyer. How did he write it? 
this is going to be the tour event of the year. Something like that. So I wanted to tell him you're wrong. It's not going to be the tour event of the year. It's going to be the tour event of the state. Never happened like that. So it will be hard to match after such an election, such an event. So I will uh, say goodbye with great wishes. I do want to dedicate some time. That I'm going to go and read some comments. Don't write me like Megillot. I will read a little bit so I can uh, answer whatever you want. And if you feel you want to ask something quickly that I can read on the comments, I will gladly address. And uh, I thank you all for joining us. If you like it, then we're going to, Bezat Hashem, do much more uh, live broadcast. I want to take advantage of the fact that I can talk. So... <laughs> thank you very much, John. Uh... <laughs> okay, I see nobody wants to ask questions, just sending hearts. That's cool too, unless you don't hear me. Okay. Please have the link to the description. Okay, in the in the in the description, you will find the links to everything. Is if anything is missing, then uh, we will uh, uh, add it later. Uh, uh, it's going too fast, so I think it's Jimmy Franklin. Maybe I'm pronouncing the word the name wrong. I'm sorry if I'm butchering your name. You're asking why Moshe Rabbeinu passed on this day. Because, first of all, we see with most of the great Sadiqim that they were born and passed on the same day. It's like the cycle of the year when the portal for them to come in and the portal for them to come out. We say many, many great Sadiqim that they uh, born and die on the same day because that's their day on the cycle of the year where their uh, effect of their soul comes down to the world. So we see in many, many great Sadiqim that the day that they were born, that's the day they were left perfect cycle of uh, completion, and not only that, the tzaddik, especially like Moshe Rabbeinu, can see in divine, divine level what's the best time to exit based on the spirit, based on many things in the spiritual world. So Moshe Rabbeinu definitely uh, knew when and when to be born and to leave. As many great tzaddikim that they know where to be buried, you know, the story with Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai that they didn't know uh, where to bury him. The same thing with Maimonides, it was Lambam. They put this coffin on a donkey and they let the donkey go and whenever the donkey stopped, that's where they buried him. Same thing with Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, they didn't know where to bury him. Same thing, put him on a, on a, on a, on a donkey, wherever it stopped, that they, that's where they buried him. So they keep know exactly where's their uh, portal to Shammai, that they know how to go up, up and down and every day on the calendar has its connection to the Sfirot. And Zayn Adal is the connection of Moshe Rabbeinu. Uh, background, a water fountain. Yes, we do have a fountain here, and we have fish, if you want to come and fish. Uh, Feng Shui. <laughs> uh, come to Canada. Uh, can come to Canada. Uh, who said that? Rami. Uh, Some platforms I can't really uh, speak so open, but uh, last that I tried to come into Canada, I, I am banned from Canada, as I was banned from the United States, and as I'm banned from a few other countries. So, if Hashem wants me to come in, I will come in. I lived in Canada, I can't stand the cold, it will have to be in the summer. <laughs> uh, I see a few more coming to Canada. Are you coming to Chicago? Uh, I told you in the beginning that there's not Hashem, I see a few coming to Chicago. Bezad uh, Hashem, in mid-June, uh, we're planning a Midwest uh, tour. That will also include Houston and many other places. Dallas, we might only do one, one location in Texas. Uh, <laughs> come to Maui. Send me the ticket. <laughs> Cosmic mytho mythology. I'll give you my name and date of birth. Just send me a ticket. I'll come to Maui any day. But I want to bring my wife and kids too. <laughs> okay, uh, if you have any questions or comments, I know you all want to come, me to come to your hometown. I see here all the uh, towns in the world that you want me to come to. So maybe ask something that I can answer. <coughs>
Texas, Vegas, Mumbai. This is like geography class, and we're going through all the cities. Uh, Canada, Netherlands. If you want me to come to your city, ask a normal question. Paris. <laughs> Guys, I love you. I see India, Mexico, Morocco, Amsterdam. <laughs> Somebody asked me, are you coming to Tzfat? <laughs> Atlanta. Guys, I know all the cities in the world. You don't have to tell me where you live. <laughs> Yes, uh, Teresa Turner, yes, yes. Uh, Tammy, you want to look for more books about Moshe Rabbeinu? It's mainly Midrashim, Yerkut Shimoni, Midrash Rabba, the Zohar, uh, all the Midrashim. There's a whole book Midrash on the life of Moshe Rabbeinu. There's a lot of books. Unfortunately, I don't think you can find them in English. Uh, My pleasure. All of your beautiful comments. I'm here, very happy to see it. And I wish for you all the same. Listen, I saw enough uh, comments here to come to Canada to make a committee to go, to go to Justin and uh, tell him, uh, let my people go. <laughs> Tammy, because other Hashem will do more lives. Now, in the next few weeks, I'm getting ready for the tour. I'm coming back from the tour straight to Pesach, then I'm going on another it will be hard, but uh, uh, we are going to incorporate much more live sessions. Uh, only if I see that there's a good question that I can uh, pick my brain, instead of telling me where you live. Emet uh, Torah, yes, Moshe Rabbeinu knew everything. Moshe Rabbeinu knew exactly who was Amalek, he knew everything. If you're asking uh, uh, Mariel about my book, you'll find it in the description, the, the link to it. Emet <laughs> uh, Torah. When is a good, uh, good question? When? That's the key, the time. How can I crush my Yetzirah? Finally, somebody who has guts to ask a question. How do you crush your Yetzirah? I think it was asked by Yael. And uh, I think she's uh, asking it in the name of everybody. How do you crush your Yetzirah? If you can win him, join him. The Yetzirah really, uh, you have to understand, and, and I started about two weeks ago a new series, and we're only going to get to talk about it, I think, when I come back from my tour. The, the topic of the series is how to win my inner battles. And I explained there that the components that I'm dealing with, it's different components. My Yetzer Ara is not my Tikkun. Yetzer Ara means my uh, evil inclination. Tikkun means my rectification. Samech Mem is Samech Mem. Foreign thoughts, it's foreign thoughts. I'm, I'm in, in the ring here with six, seven entities that are causing my confusion. A lot of the distractions that I get in my life, it's my own sins, not my Yetzer Ara. So, you can either rephrase the question and say, how do I crush the competition? Or how do I manage to overpower all my challenges? Doesn't matter where it's come from. That's one answer. <coughs> and that really is a long answer and you'll have to be patient for the series of how do you to win your inner battles. But if it's just the Yetzirah that you want to crush, then I made a, a friendship pact with my Yetzirah a long time ago. I just leave him room to do his things, and I don't bother him too much. Because when I bother him, that's when he gets upset. So I kind of try to uh, uh, ride the wave without causing too much attention to the Yetzirah. But nevertheless, the Yetzirah, I look at him as my personal trainer. Because if I wouldn't have a Yetzirah, I wouldn't try to do anything, and I wouldn't uh, put effort into anything, everything would come easy. What's the point? So the answer really is a good component in my life. If you know how to uh, control the answer to a certain extent, and really to accept the, the challenge when it comes. 
You can crush the Yetzirah. Don't try. He will crush you in a second and a half. Like I told you, you can join them. You can uh, win them, join them. Work hand in hand with the Yetzirah. At the end of the day, the Yetzirah is hired by the master of the universe to, to, to put you through these challenges. Without that, you won't even grow. So if you make your Yetzirah an enemy, good luck. If you want it to be a little bit more successful, then know how to go parallel with the Yetzirah and to uh, dodge bullets and not to, uh, not to bother him too much. Besides that, then you'll have many tests that are coming from many different directions. As I mentioned in that lecture, you have tests from Shemaim, from Hashem, just to test your reaction. You have things that are haunting you from your previous life. You can call it a tikkun, you can call it a, a whatever you want. Then you have things that bother you from the sins that you do in this life. And then you really have the Samach Mem that sometimes doesn't want you to do something and he will go full, full force against you. So we're working here in so many different components that the right way is to, to become stealth and not to put too much attention to, to the, these uh, uh, entities. And the long answer, you'll have to be patient to the uh, series that how to win your inner battles, which uh, you never crush your Yetzirah, but you can just have the upper hand. It's the wrong terminology. Don't go for crushing, because he will rise up against you and crush you five times more faster than you can think. You need to keep a safe distance. I hope that was a... a uh, uh, quick and to the point, uh, you're asking me when Mashiach is coming. If I would know, then I would tell you. Uh, should we in the Sidu? Uh, yeah, you're asking Ben about the 30 principles. Any prayer book, you can find it. The 30 principles of Maimonides, you can even Google it. Uh, the continuation of the El Bab series. Now I'm live, I can't answer too many questions. The Erev Av series was interrupted by a certain situation. And when it's going to be good and safe to go back, we will go back. What and what? Hold on. Ah, the prayer is going to pass. Roy, the prayers and the, of the day, go to the link, you'll find the link to uh, atzmo.org forward slash Zayin Adal, you'll find all the prayers there. Hatsamech to you all, happy Purim to you all. I'm reading your comments, yes, I'm trying to read the comments. Why did I stop doing lectures about Mashiach that is coming? Because he's, he's still coming. I don't see many people really taking my advice that uh, fast. Uh, it seems like a lot of the comments are repeating themselves. Maybe it's some glitch in YouTube or uh, how does one get rid of the people? Ah, okay, here's a good question. The phenom 718, how does one get rid of the clipot? First, you have to stop sinning. The clipot you create when you sin. So first of all, you close the tap, no more feeding the clipot. You're not creating the clipot, and once you stop the, I call it the, the faucet, then they, they don't have any life. You have to understand that a clipot is like a tick. It has no life form of itself. It needs to sit onto another life form and suck its life uh, through the thickest blood. That's what the klipa does. We create the klipa with our action, with my sin. Then it comes to me and it sucks my energy as long as I give it. So if I sin with the shonara, once I stop, then I stop feeding that uh, klipa. Whether it's uh, lying, cheating. So the first of all, you have to stop supply. You gotta cut the supply. Once you cut the supply, go 40, 40 days without sinning at all, lock yourself in a cell, 40 days without sinning, you'll see the power of the klipa is diminished by 90%, because you didn't feed it for, 90, for 40 days. 
Then once you close the, the faucet and you're not feeding it anymore, then you have to start destroying it. There are many ways to destroy the klipa. The Rizal says the most powerful way to destroy the klipa is reciting the bedtime Shema, Kriyat Shema Lamita, but the whole thing. Not just to say Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokein Hashem Echad, to read the entire Kriyat Shema with confession, with accepting four uh, heavenly deaths. The Rizal says that when you do the entire set of Kriyat Shema Lamita, you are able to destroy 1,125 destructive angels report that you have created. And there are other ways to destroy it, mainly by learning Torah. Uh, Torah is a, a compared to fire. Now, not, no entity can uh, be in the heat of the Torah. So when you learn a lot of Torah, then the clipot that you created, you melt them off. And, and there are many other ways, but I would mainly focus on not feeding the clipot. Now I know it's a catch-22, because you sin, you do Shema, you feed the Kippah. You want to win the battle, then you need to, to make sure that there's no, you're not feeding the Kippah. When I needed to go on a very strong spiritual diet, then I would put myself in a situation where for 40 days I don't have the option so much of sinning, and then you weaken the Kippah tremendously. And when did I realize this power? Uh, some may know, some may not. Uh, in the, in the, when I started becoming observant, then uh, after my near death experience, uh, I, uh, I was involved in many illegal activities, let's put it uh, there, and I got arrested and I sat in jail for a year and a half. And that's really when I made Chuba. In jail is when I started becoming observant. And I noticed that after a few months in jail where I didn't have how to sin, you really don't have much how to sin in jail. Uh, I didn't have who to talk to, so there was no Roshon There's nobody look, I mean, you don't look at anything, no internet, no nothing. So I noticed how, uh, and of course I went on a hunger strike and I demanded kosher food. So it took them like two months to get me for kosher food. I only ate apples. So I noticed how my lack of sin diminished the, the kippah. And then I was able to really ride on their wave and start growing and growing. So whenever I needed a spiritual boost, boost I, I would go somewhere and, and lock myself for 40 days minimum, learn Torah all day long, spiritual diet, and I, I see how the kippah is diminished and diminished and diminished. And uh, Bezat Hashem, there are many other ways. Uh, Juliana, is Tehillim equal to the Torah? No, Tehillim is part of the Tanakh, it's from the Ketubim, from the scripts. The power of Tehillim is much less than the prophets and much less than the Torah. But with no doubt, reading Tehillim uh, is extremely, extremely powerful, especially for the ones who don't know how to read the Torah. Because in order to learn the Torah, you need to understand what you're reading. And in Tehillim, you don't need to understand what you're reading. Uh, who's Mashiach bin Yosef? Uh, apples. Hmm. Are you asked what I used to eat in jail besides apples? I ate my heart. Uh, I, all the comments that thanking me, you all welcome. I love you all. I live for you. I hope I'll see you in New York or New Jersey or Miami. You better be there. Will, will uh, PK is asking, will the person who commits suicide re re reincarnate? We don't know. We don't know. Uh, that's up to God. There's no clear source if they will or they're not. It's a horrible thing to uh, uh, commit suicide. Uh, uh, kind of compared to murder. But uh, there's no indication if they will or will not be uh, uh, incarnated. Take the consideration that some people who commit suicide, the, uh, they cannot really be judged. Some people who commit suicide are heavily on drugs or in such situations that they're not thinking with the right mind and that God knows what's in their heart 
And I do believe that not all will get severely punished. It depends. It depends. Don't take my words out of context. It's one of the most severe sins one can do. I don't suggest. Besides, why would one somebody want to do that? It's worse up there. Uh, but uh, we don't have a clear indication if one would get incarnated after a suicide. Uh, how long to read Torah besides Minyan? There's no uh, measurement for how much Torah to, to, to read because it depends how much clipot you have. You have a lot of clipot, you need a lot of Torah. How do you get rid of very bad addictions? That's why we started the uh, Roy. That's why we started the Booting Your Inner Battle series, uh, because that's what we're going to talk about. It's not so simple. It's not an answer in a, in a chat. How do you get rid of uh, addictions? Uh, I can tell you the easy, uh, oh, the short answer, it's all in your mind. And uh, I can testify. I was addicted to any substance that is existing in the world, and uh, I was able to, to, to stop with all the horrible addictions that I had. So I have a little bit of advice and a little bit of experience, but it's not so simple, I can't answer in a comment. But definitely, every person can get rid of their uh, addictions. That's why we started the, the, the series, because the winning your inner battle, a lot of it is addictions. And it depends on the addiction, but I know that everything, uh, anything and everything can be overpowered with the help of Hashem, of course. Uh, uh, Yeshua Dad, you wrote, I haven't found yet an answer to that question in the video. So maybe ask the question, I'll try to answer. Uh, Okay, it looks like there's maybe a conversation between uh, a few people, so if you want to address the question to me, I'll try to answer. Uh, if uh, the sunny grow, you want to schedule the classes in spot, you have to uh, join the local WhatsApp group, and then you'll get notified of local classes in spot, and if you want the number, if you are on any of the groups, uh, of my WhatsApp groups, it's the same number. Just uh, send a message and ask to be added to the local group. Uh, Adina, Adina Rabi, if I pronounce your word right. If you try to ex ex escape your tikkun, you're going to mess up the entire reason why you're here. Do not try to avoid your tikkun. Uh, let me read it again. If you this information, can be bypassed by being fully observant and mitzvot. If you become fully observant and fully observant of the mitzvot, that's that's how you uh, participate your tikkun. Hashem will give you to rectify through Torah and mitzvot and not through suffering. So, first of all, the more you add in Torah and mitzvot in your tshuva, that diminishes suffering and punishments and all that stuff. More than that, one should not try to avoid their tikkun. If the tikkun is thrown into your face, then bite it, or whatever they say, bite the dust and, and go through it. You don't want to miss your tikkun. Excuse me? Bite the bullet. Not the bite the bullet. Uh, when I say bite the dust, isn't there a song? No, 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 bite the dust. <laughs> bite the dust is dying. Bite the bullet is... Bite the bullet is uh, take it like a man. Yeah. So yeah, bite the bullet. Or just take it like a man and, and, and understand that uh, and uh, and understand that it's it's all good for you. And with no doubt, the more you increase in Torah and Mitzvot, that that's the, that's how you reduce the tikkun. So of course, you want to uh, enlarge in Torah and Mitzvot. Uh, yeah, what somebody ko or every ko cheta? You wrote it nice, but. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, El Sharon, before the flood, everybody lived till a very long age. 
and uh, you're right, till 900s, 800s, and the Kadosh Bavu, in the, in the recommendation of Malachi Asharet, Malachi Asharet said, listen, if they're going to live for eight, nine hundred years, they're going to have sins like from here till tomorrow. And the heavenly committee decided that they will, re will be reduced, only not to add more and more and more sins. If you live 900 years, you're going to accumulate tons of sins. So the heavenly court uh, suggested and they reduced the, the mortality to, to about 180, uh, give or take. And then slowly, slowly it was reduced for the exact same thing, the same reason, that we have less time on this, uh, in this world, less time to sin. <clears throat> Uh, a lot of the questions are not clear. It says, where was his resting place? Uh, I'm assuming you're asking where Moshe Rabbeinu's resting place. Nobody knows where Moshe Rabbeinu's resting place is. It's somewhere in the desert. Uh, and the reason why it's not uh, revealed is that it should not become an idolatry and people will go there and try to, uh, I don't know what. Uh, no, uh, knowledge and power. New York and New Jersey, it's two different topics. Uh, Miami, New York, Los Angeles, and probably all the major cities, it's going to be one topic. Uh, wait for the flyers. Uh, I want to keep you a little bit on the edge, but if you look at the last flyer that was posted, you'll understand. I mean, you, what, what, what am I going to talk about? Do you think I'm going to talk about uh, uh, many? You know what I'm going to talk about. But I'm going to be nice. I'm not going to come and scream. I'm going to be nice. I'm telling you, I'm coming to an event. It's not a, the lecture is a part of the event. The topic is going to be powerful, and everything else is going to be powerful, but specifically New York and New Jersey is not the same topic uh, for many different reasons. And New, New Jersey, uh, my daughter, who is uh, joining me on this trip, and the ones of you who saw me in previous trips, you know that my daughter comes to me with me on all my trips. Uh, she suggested I do a uh, Rabbi Nava's near-death experience like never told before and to tell you some things that you never heard before. Uh, but I choose to say something else. Uh, I will think of what to say that it will be a very interesting lecture. How much are you going to charge for the... what? The, the lectures are free. We don't charge for lectures. Uh, incredible can wait, go Hashem. This is Moshe and his wife were doing a second night. Uh, I'm John uh, Luke, if I'm pronouncing the word, your name right. Uh, I am going to make a series of lectures about the shape of the earth. I did not start making them because like the Erev Rav, the Erev Rav series was supposed to be a lecture. And the lecture ended up being two, three hours and then another 22 lectures, which I didn't even scrape the bottom of the topic. Same thing with the shape of the earth, I wanted it to be a lecture. The more I looked into uh, uh, sources, I figured out this is going to be a series. So you're going to have to wait patiently. Uh, can we approach the courts of heavens like our stages? Yes, you can. Our sages, of course, were great, uh, uh, were great scholars. They're very high-level uh, uh, spiritual, very high-level uh, souls. But each and every one of us has the power to shake the heavens and to do more than any great tzaddik ever in the history. Uh, how many hours are we fasting? If you're talking about the fast of Esther, it's from uh, dawn to uh, start going. Uh, with Natasha, I actually haven't saw have ever uh, a prayer book that is just for women and a prayer book just for men. Uh, if there is, I don't see a reason why it should be a problem doing it, as long as the words are not uh, distorted. If the, the Sidhu uh, is 100% as it should be, then there's no issue. But if you have a siddur that addresses uh, just for the women, so in the morning prayers it says uh, 
instead of Shilo Asani Ishia, Shasani Kirtzono. I don't think any publication came out with a whole Sido for uh, you know changing three blessings. Uh, I don't know any Sido like that, but uh, but if you find it, there's no uh, there's no uh, prohibition of reading from that. Unless the, the, the there's words are uh, there's not a Sido, but there's a book of prayers. I think it's called a name. No, 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 she was asking about a Sidhu for a man and Sidhu for a woman. There are uh, prayer books for women, yeah. But uh, a Sidhu just for a man, just for a woman, I never saw something like that. Uh, if there is, go ahead, as long as the words are not distorted. If somebody took the Sidhu and started messing up the words, then it's not a Sidhu. There is one in Nisas, um, Ashkenaz? No, it's for women? Okay, but that's... Uh, okay, okay, but... Uh, okay, you're right. But it's not really just for women. I mean, a man can pray from that. Right, but it is... It is it's, it, it's, yeah, it's... Uh, uh, how do you say the word? It's directed to a woman. Right. So if you want to look... I lost the name already because the names went up. But if you want to look for a Sidhu for women, then uh, a Sidhu, a Mizrahi Sidhu, Shari Tzion... Bat Tzion. sorry. And, and yeah, and you might be able to uh, to find it. I can't pass with the little stairs as I get sick. Can I do something instead? If you get sick or there's some type of medical condition, then you have to keep the food to a minimum. You can't eat steaks and sushi and enjoy. You eat the minimum of the minimum of the minimum. And the, what you want to do is to take an amount that will value what will cost you the meals a day, $10, $20, $30, and that you will give to charity. And uh, when you can, if you get to a point that you're uh, uh, physically strong, then you can uh, pay back that, that fast. And uh, listen, the Torah is not expecting you to get worse. So if you, but really sick, not like fix it. Uh, I'm hoping to come to Miami for the, uh, the, the children with me. Would still recommend adults only. Uh, Rachel, uh, shalom. I'm not going to talk about anything that is uh, rated R, but I do talk sometimes strong and harsh, and I might say things that uh, might scare a child. Depend depend on the child. I mean, when I tell my eight-year-old that we might be attacked with nuclear bombs and have to hide under the, the ground, she doesn't care. She's like, ah, oh, ah. Uh, but some kids might be like, what? The world? No. So uh, I can promise you there's not going to be foul language, there's not going to be anything rated R, and there's not going to be anything violent. Uh, I say if they're not too young and, they're, and they, they're, they can come. And, and by the way, to any one of you who's planning on coming, it's not going to be a lecture like you saw in the last five, six years. For that, I have YouTube. I'm not coming to America to give you a lecture. So it's not going to be a three-hour lecture with sources and, uh, and then hitting you on the head and telling you that the whole world is about to collapse and to avoid the, all the uh, this and that. That's not what you're, what you're going to get. You're going to get a powerful message. So I definitely think uh, children can come. Uh, it's going to be a long event, you know, it uh, depends on uh, how old they are. Uh, Zodi, Zodi Bear, thank you. Uh, Anoah, Anoah, Noah is allowed to learn about idolatry when studying history. Noah, Noah is need to learn about idolatry to know what not to do. Uh, Noah is uh, we're going to have to take care of you, Noids, my dear friend Noids, because there's no guidance to the Noids yet. Uh, I suggest always to Noids, pretend you're a Jew. That's what I suggest. Of course, certain things you can't follow, can't do, but pretend you're like in the level that you want to do most of it, and then of course you have to find the guidance, what you're not allowed to do, the Chaz will get you in trouble. But... Uh, but uh, definitely one of the most important things for Noah is to learn about idolatry, what Judaism is perceiving idolatry, that maybe if you come in from a certain background, you'll be like, oh, I used to do that. And then, of course, you need to repent. 
uh, uh, Mike Klein, uh, one last time, coming on solar eclipse. I'm coming because Hashem wants me to come. The solar eclipse is secondary. Uh, where does Tanakh say about incarnation? Rachel, go to atzmut.com and uh, there's a series there of Gate of Incarnation. You can watch the first few classes with introduction, they are all free. And you will get a very, very deep explanation, not only where the Tanakh says about incarnation, where it says in the Torah, the references, everything. So again, at uh, go look for the course of reincarnation. It's part of the paid members uh, area, but the first few videos are all free. And of course, you are more than welcome to join uh, at smooth.com. That's how we support our, our, our organization, by your subscriptions. And then you'll get an in-depth course about uh, uh, incarnations, which you'll get all the answers that you need. Where you're asking Gary if I'm recording this lecture. Uh, it's on YouTube. It's recorded live. You can be, it will be found on YouTube, uh, not under videos, under live. But you can definitely find it. Uh, is uh, John, is it likely that Mashiach was born in 2011? <laughs> the birth of Mashiach, you have to understand that it is the birth of the body and the birth of the soul. The body is not necessarily knows that it's going to uh, host the soul of Mashiach. There are opinions that Mashiach right now knows he's Mashiach, he's just keeping quiet. And to the majority of the opinion is that even he doesn't know that he's Mashiach. He's a pious individual, humble, with great uh, virtues and great midot and great uh, characteristics and the Susei loves the Torah and all the good things. And he's a candidate for, to be Mashiach and in the right time and in the right decision. As the prophet Yeshaya or Isaiah says, The Spirit of God dwells on this individual. Then the soul of Mashiach gets impregnated into this person, and he becomes Mashiach. So uh, we don't know if he knows, if we know, but with no doubt the soul of Mashiach is uh, going to choose to which body it's going to get impregnated. Where is the best, best place to go for free camping? I think you're on the wrong uh, chat. <laughs> Can you explain what the red heifer represents in such a time? The red heifer is a significant component in the coming of Mashiach because one of the first things that's going to happen with the coming of Mashiach, Mashiach is going to resurrect a few individuals, Moshe Rabbeinu, Aaron Akoin, and a few other students that will help them with setting everything up. And one of the first things that they're going to do is Be'ezrat uh, Hashem build a Mizbeach, an altar, and one of the first things in the coming of Mashiach is the burning of the red heifer, the slaughtering, the burning, and then taking the water and sprinkling everybody with the holy water, because that's what removes the impurity of death, and by that Mashiach can reverse the situation of death, and then we are not bound anymore to death in the world. And of course, there's difference of opinions, how fast it will happen, when it will happen, and uh, will it affect right away, because Rambam says that there will still be death when Mashiach comes. There's difference of opinions, everything has explanations. I think I covered in many of my classes many of these topics. And uh, by the fact that we're finding red heifers all over the world, that's another one of the many signs that Mashiach is coming, that, is already, that Hashem is already giving us the knowledge the red heifers are accessible. It's just another strong message to us to know that it's very, very close, that Hashem is already telling us to the whole world, here, I'm showing you a red heifer, what he did see for hundreds of years. Uh, I'm going to read more questions in a second. You have a question? Yeah, I did. Uh, you mentioned during the lecture that... Moshe Rabbeinu knew to take with him the staff of Yosef and that he used the uh, name of Hashem to kill the Egyptian. If he was raised in Pharaoh's palace, where did he get this knowledge? Okay, very good question. I'm going to say it out loud. I don't know if everybody heard. Uh, if Moshe Rabbeinu uh, was raised in the house of Pharaoh, 
and uh, needless to say, in a house of uh, idolatry and witchcraft, how did he have divine uh, knowledge? How did he know to take uh, Yosef's staff? How did he know all the things? And like I told you, he was born already with Ruach Kodesh. He was born already with a very high level soul. Moshe Rabbeinu, can you imagine with the capacity of the soul? And the whole time that he, when he was in the house of Pharaoh, Malach Gabriel was his kabuta. So Malach Gabriel, the angel Gabriel, the one who moved his hand for not taking the, the precious stone, and in many cases uh, as, uh, assisted him to escape uh, the palace when he was 18. So Malach Gabriel was the Chavruta, the partner of uh, Moshe Rabbeinu and told him everything and everything that Moshe Rabbeinu grew in the house of Pharaoh. He knew there's some type of mission that needs to be done. It was just not revealed to him at this time, but he already was in a very high level that he was already acquainted to the Torah and to the, the knowledge of God while he was young, throughout the time that Malach Gabriel escorted him, and even Malach Gabriel, the whole time in Moshe Rabbeinu's life, Malach, the king, uh, angel Gabriel is, is with him. So Moshe Rabbeinu was, uh, he knew what's going on, he just didn't involve himself in uh, any of the idolatry or any of the Tum'ah, the impurity in the palace. The same thing with the uh, Kush. He said, okay, I'll marry the queen, but uh, take marriage. So Moshe Rabbeinu says, I'll play the game. It's like a, a how do you call it? A, a, I don't know, a spy. Like a double agent. He was like, I'll, I'll play good here and I'll get what I need here. So, uh, but with no question, uh, Malach Gabriel told him the entire Torah. He was already uh, very, very educated uh, in uh, later years. Okay, thank you. Have a wonderful Zion, uh, Adab. I'm not saying goodbye to you. Uh, and there's a lot of sharing, but I don't see you happy Purim. And uh, look for the schedule for the events of Purim. Uh, I'm going to say on the Jewish everything and everything is. Ah, very good. Erica, uh, do we have angels and guides that help us daily? Yes. And a huge yes. First of all, your good deeds create angels and they help you. Uh, the mitzvot that you do, the commandments, create good deeds, these angels, and they help you. Uh, souls from the world above and many other situations will cause guardian angels to surround you. Now, when you do something good for someone, and I'm not talking about giving them money, or I'm talking that you give them advice or you give them uh, an ear to listen to some, some of their... They need to pour their heart out. Whatever, you do something good to a person, and that person is really, really appreciative to what you did to them, and they wish for you well, and they pray for you, they're creating more of these angels, these guardian angels that follow you all day long and guard you and protect you. With no doubt. No doubt. Uh, will you do a class on the courts of heaven? I did a, 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 I did a, a many of them. The thing is, with many of my new followers, uh, I have a, a videos online from 2011. So if you started following me last year, you're missing 13 years of material. What I suggest is either to look for it on YouTube or to go to Smooth, where, where it's my website, where it's organized by categories and uh, topics. And uh, if you started listening to me only in the last few years, then you're missing most of my teachings. I know that most of my new followers are from the last four years. I have looked uh, at my statistics and my numbers. And in 2019, which is when I left the United States, and not left, I mean, I, I live in Israel, but last time I was in the United States, I looked at the numbers of 2019 and the numbers of 2024, and I have 10 times more the followers of what I had in 2019. So 90% of my followers never saw me live because I didn't go on any tour in the last four, four and a half years since Corona. And, uh, and not only that, if, unless you went backwards, you're missing most of my teachings. So I, a lot of the questions, if you go through my teachings, you'll find all these topics. Uh, it's already in thousands of classes, so a lot of the classes, I don't know how to direct you, but if you go to atsmooth.com, 
then you will see by categories, and then it will make it uh, much more easier. Uh, what else? Uh, person. Uh, uh, RG. We don't know if Aaron was sick in Hamburg. If you're asking about that era, then with no doubt Aaron was the second humble. If you're asking in all the history of the Jewish nation, that I don't know. I don't know if there was maybe another person uh, more humble. Um, okay. I am going to sign off soon. I was very happy I could uh, answer some questions and interact. Uh, I unfortunately don't interact much with my followers uh, just because the difference in place, distance, and, uh, and mainly, mainly the quantities. I can already use the, this uh, as a platform to apologize. Ten years ago, some of the followers that I know personally Ten years ago, you could get me on my phone. Now, unfortunately, uh, thousands and thousands of followers. I can't answer the phone to everybody. I can't answer comments, uh, messages, uh, emails. Uh, it's nothing personally against you. Chas v'shalom. I love you all. If it was up to me, I would dedicate a whole day for each and every one of my followers. But realistically, I can't do it. Uh, in the 24 hours of the day that I have, as it is, it's overflowing with busy. Uh, you know, so many people were emailing us now. Oh, Rabbi, you're coming to New York. I want to I talk to you. I want to meet you and talk to you. I wish I could sit and talk to each and every one of you and have a good cup of coffee. But uh, there's no time. And there's thousands and thousands of people who want to see me, talk to me. So, unfortunately, I don't have the luxury of really talking with followers and students unless they're here, local. So if you want to uh, get a lot of me, then you have to move to Tzfat. You can talk to some of the people here who moved to Tzfat from different places, South Africa, uh, America. I mean, we have a lot. Uh, and don't come especially to Tzfat for me, because I'm busy. I, 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 I'm not like, available all the time. God gave me many, many challenges and many, many uh, 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 projects to work on. Most of it is not so, so revealed. You know me as teaching. I do many other things. So uh, that's why I'm going to try to initiate all these live uh, uh, recordings where I can uh, uh, read comments and, and, uh, and interact. By the way, just if you know, the fact that I don't answer, I, I read a lot of emails and comments and messages. The messages that funnel in, they get filtered, and, and I see a lot of them. And I try to go as much as I can on the YouTube and, and comment back, and, and I, I apologize. I wish I had much more time to do that uh, and to interact with people more on a personal level. But Bezat Hashem, come to the lectures that I'm going to do, New York, New Jersey, Miami, uh, and later on in Los Angeles and all the rest of the uh, locations. Uh, one invisible song stress you asked about the 12-hour lecture on the first NDE. Uh, you're going to have to wait for the book and for the movie. Uh, should women pray at the Arizal, part of the Shema Amita, that takes, talks about Bitu Tzitzit, uh, tzitzit and Tulin? Wendy. Yes, yes, women have to do that too, even though you don't wear Tzitzit and you don't wear Tulin and you don't mevat and Tulin and Tzitzit, but you have a husband. And he does. And you have a son, or maybe you still don't have a son, there's other things you will have, and you still do it for a tikkun for the neshama. Because your soul uh, also has a, a male component that's in your husband or your husband to be. And when you do that, you are helping him to reach his tikkun. Definitely, women should uh, recite the whole Arizal prayer with no question. Uh, what else? Okay, I think uh, YouTube is doing something because I see repeating uh, comments all the time. But anyways, it's time for me to wrap it up. As much as I love uh, talking to you, 
those of you who are living in the U.S. should make an effort and go see Rav Alon Anava in person instead of asking him to come to your city. <laughs> you have to understand, it's not so easy to come to every city. Uh, if it was up to me, I told you, I would come to you to lunch. But I have a very, very tight schedule, coordinating trips, flights, it's not so easy. Uh, I would love to do that. Uh, very, very soon you will be uh, acquainted with some of my very large projects. And uh, one of them I can tell you that you're going to uh, find out in a week. We're going to expose it or do the premiere or whatever you want to call it. And then there's a few huge projects that we're working on. And I hope very soon that you'll find out about them. Uh, I will make separate videos explaining about them before I come to the United States because we might want to have people participate and uh, people have expertise and the knowledge that can help. Which, by the way, I don't know how many people are still on the, on the class and how many people uh, went off. But if you're in the class and you uh, live in one of the cities that I've uh, mentioned that I'm coming to, we do need a lot of help uh, in organizing and reaching out. Uh, if you feel you can help in any type of a way, you can go to the website, the link is in the description, smooth.org forward slash tour, and we're going to post there things that we need help with, whether it's uh, distributing flyers, uh, hanging posters, at the night of the event, uh, a lot of uh, helping hands, if you have any qualifications, photographer, singer, uh, whatever it is that you have and you think that you can contribute, A, it's a huge mitzvah, B, you'll be a partner in a huge outreach to all events and tour events, making a ship extremely happy. And needless to say, you get a, a, a one, one big size mitzvah. So we need a little help with organizing. I mean, we have my crew, but there's always need of more help if you have a connection with the right hole, with the right uh, uh, individual that what we need. So please, if we need help as much as possible, mainly uh, spreading the word, sharing on your social media, sharing on, the, on all your platforms that everybody should know. I, I don't have uh, ultimate reach. I reach a certain amount of people, and then there are many people who uh, you will have to reach uh, for us. So, uh, definitely, definitely we need help as much as possible if you can. I want to read here something from, uh, uh, I think I'm reading the, the name right, Inez. Is Tikkun success dependent on all parties involved? With no doubt, with no doubt, the answer is yes. If I have a Tikkun involving three, four people, we all have to participate and do what we need to do in order for the tikkun to work. Unfortunately, some people don't get it. Uh, yeah, it's, but everybody has to participate. It's not that one says, I'll do my part. I've mentioned many times in my classes about the story with the rich person who could find a uh, husband to her daughter, his daughter, and then eventually she found a Torah scholar, and the father gave him uh, half of his fortune to take care of the daughter. And then a month after the wedding, the, father, the, the daughter died, and the father asked for the money back from the son who they both argued and went to the Beit Din, and Arab Yosef Karo, the author of the Beit, uh, of the Beit Yosef, the uh, Shulchan Aruch, ruled for the father that the son has to give the money back. But when they went to the Arizal, the Arizal says, if you want to come back to, uh, to this world again, then, do, and then give him the money. But you have to understand, the father, the, uh, the husband, and the daughter, and the wife, were all an uh, incarnation from a previous life where they all were partners and the father and the daughter uh, 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 cheated the, the chatan, the groom, out of his money and they all came back in an incarnation to a situation that everybody had to fix and if it's in the result of the time told the father, if you don't fix it, all three of you come back again. So no doubt, everybody has to participate in the tikkun. Now comes, of course, the big question. What if another person doesn't know that it's part of the tikkun? Or what if they're very, uh, uh, what's the word, uh, stubborn and they don't want to participate? Then uh, you take David the Menach's advice from chapter uh, 18 in Tehilim, where he says, In gvar tamim titamam, in ikesh titapal, sorry, in gvar tamim titamad, in chasit titchasad, in ikesh titapal. 
uh, if somebody is uh, uh, good with you, 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 you deal with them the same way. But if somebody is tricky and, uh, and going around uh, and around to, to try to trick you, then you can do the same thing to trick that person. And if somebody is uh, causing you an issue, whether it's part of the tikkun and you know that it's benefiting them, then you need to somehow manipulate the situation that they will understand it and accept it. So that's, it's not so easy. It's not so easy. And that's why we're learning Shavad Gurim and all these series that one can really learn how to deal with all these situations. Yeshuv uh, Adat, is there any sin a Noah can commit that Hashem will not forgive? First of all, I'm not uh, on Hashem's committee to know what he's going to forgive or not. But if, uh, uh, I mean, I don't know what to tell you because it's not, it's, there's no difference between a Noah and, and a Jew. Uh, I can ask the same question. What is the uh, sin that a Jew will do and Hashem will not forgive? So uh, we don't know because Hashem has his own system. And he can give, forgive to one person who did real tshuva and not forgive another person who didn't do real tshuva. I can tell you for a fact, Jew or non-Jew, if you repent the right way and you never do the sin again and you change your life completely, doesn't matter what you did, Hashem will forgive you. But your tshuva has to be 180 degrees, total different person, no way 99%. If your tshuva is 100% and you did rectifications and the right repentance, yes, the Holy Script explains that if you do the tshuva the right way, you will be forgiven, no one or a Jew. But if you don't do the right tshuva, no guarantee. Uh, uh, okay. I'm going to sign off. Bezad Hashem. Thank you so much. I, I, I'm afraid I'm going to butcher your name. Doha Bukra. Did I pronounce your, word, your name right? I'm sorry if I didn't. But thank you so much. I appreciate uh, the comments, uh, and I'm very happy that my teachings are, are helping you and many others. Uh, so nice to hear that. Uh, okay, okay. I see a lot of the comments are from uh, people talking to each other. <laughs> so Jennifer, uh, tell your toddlers, thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, very much, all of you. Uh, is it, is not finding a soulmate a curse? Sometimes it can be a curse, sometimes it's part of the tikkun, sometimes you just have to be very patient. Uh, it's very hard to pinpoint. If you uh, uh, hurt real badly, uh, I, I don't know uh, if PK is, if you are a man or a woman, so I'm going to talk like as if you're a man. Uh, if you hurt a woman dearly by promising her that you're going to marry her and uh, take care of her and then you took off, there's a very good chance that her uh, anger or her not letting go can, I wouldn't call it a curse, but can stop you from finding your other half. That's one scenario out of many. Uh, but... Uh, I wouldn't so say a, a curse in all cases. It can be, uh, let's use your term curse, but that can happen if, like I told you, I gave you one example, can have, it can happen in other examples, that some people use uh, witchcraft and sorcery and magic to put a curse on another person, not to find their other half. And again, like if you broke somebody's heart, then they might go look for a witch to put a curse on you. Uh, I can tell you already, that if you surround yourself with the light of the Torah, no witch, no sorcerer, or no curse can harm you. Uh, Shalom, we would love to have you on a podcast for black Jews in America. Uh, the Seven Wisdoms, contact my assistant, uh, rabbialonanavi.gmail.com or admin at, at smooth.org. And you can uh, try to book a podcast or whatever meeting we can. I can tell you already that 
till uh, my tour, I'm extremely busy, then the tour, then Pesach, then another tour, it will be very hard to find the time. Uh, PK is not finding a soul made a curse. Oh, you asked that already. Oh, you asked it a few times, so you get your answer. Uh, smart. Uh, we should all focus on our Vedat Hashem and do our mitzvot, bringing, being grateful and and then, of course, yeah, yes, Blanca, you're right, 100%. Thank you, Sophia, for the beautiful wishes. Uh, uh, Mike Klein, I haven't found the book yet, uh, but it left me free to care, take care of my parents. Sometimes Hashem doesn't give you your other half because you are, in this time, you have to do something else. You have to take your parents, you have to uh, in-depth your tour learning. When I uh, wanted to get married and I started uh, going on, uh, on dates, then I couldn't find my other half. And I understood that it's not the right time for me to get married. And I admitted myself into a yeshiva. And I was 28 at the time. And I said, okay, I'll learn till I'm 30. And then when I go out, it's still young. I will uh, find my wife. And I understood that now is the time for me to learn Torah. Uh, the Yetzirah didn't want me to learn Torah, so two weeks after I went to Yeshiva, I met my wife. So, but it didn't stop me, I still learned, but sometimes Hashem is holding your, your Zivug, uh, because you need to concentrate on other things. And maybe right now, exactly like you wrote, you need to take care of your parents. I can tell you're ready for all the singles out there, that I've announced it a few times that we're working on some uh, Shiduch platform. Be'ezrat Hashem, Be'ezrat Hashem, uh, to this trip it's going to be ready. And we prepared a platform for Shiduchim. It's not a dating site, it's something completely different. You'll have to uh, stay tuned. But I'm giving you, in on a little hint, uh, I'm giving you an in on a little uh, surprise that we're working on it day and night and Be'ezrat Hashem will have something ready for this coming tour. And I hope we'll be able to uh, uh, help many, many, many singles. Uh, I saw a question here that caught my eye. Uh, how do you protect yourself from witchcraft, family? Uh, Torah. You have to surround yourself with Torah. Nothing is more powerful than the Torah. And how exactly? It's both learning Torah, reading, feeling, everything that you can do. Uh, talk more about the can, what is it, can the dates to be Mashiach. There is not only one to be chosen by Hashem. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce your name. Ketel, I think. Ketel Adonah. Uh, we're not allowed to speculate with Mashiach. When you say talking about the candidates, I don't want to even talk about the candidate because we, we have the obligation in believing that Mashiach is going to come. We have the obligation of to wait for him every day like as if he's coming today. We have the obligation of learning everything, but we are not allowed to seek who is Mashiach. And when people point their fingers with Mashiach, it causes a lot of anger in Shemaim, and it causes a lot of problems in the heavens. So we don't want to uh, 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 speculate who are the candidates. It's none of our business. God will choose the right person, and I trust him. Uh, no, 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 don't worry about Mike. I'm, I, when I want to wrap it out, wrap it up, I'm clicking, clicking the end button. I'm, I'm now looking at my watch. It's now 9.58 p.m. 10 p.m. I'm going to shut it down. Uh, Mike, you should know that I, I, I know how to... I, <laughs> I run the show. Rebbe, looks like you're going to on the... Live till next minyan. No, 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 no. It's only 10 p.m. here. Not no nets and not no. I still have a long night to go, and I still want to go back to Milan. I have a, a, another question. I have a very important question. Can a narcissist who is willing to change be completely help, healed of it? For me, it is very important. Thank you very much for your teaching. Psalm 23. That's what I have to tell you. 20 plus years ago, I was the narcissist you can imagine. Yes, you can do tshuva and you can become a normal person. Very soon, all of my followers in the entire world will be acquainted with many more uh, 
situations that occurred in my life. You may know about my near-death experience. Uh, you think it's in depth, but you don't know much in depth really what happened. Also the second one, the jail part. I, I, I may throw bits and pieces here and there, but you'll have to wait very soon. The world will know exactly my history, my past, and, and all for the good, because uh, I, I was able to get myself out of very difficult situations. And, uh, and yeah, one of them, I was the most narcissist, egocentral, egocentric, egocentral, centric, however you say that, person in the world. So there's hope for everybody. But the person, only that person needs to do the switch. And it took me to be dead for seven minutes with no pulse to shake my uh, reality. But it, it can be done. I know people that it can be done. How about a single no? How about, I don't understand the word, but I'm assuming it's how about a 71 year old single noid. Kim Hansen, if you're asking about the uh, matchmaking service, it's for any person, anywhere in the world, any age. Uh, what can a Jewish person do when married to a person who falsely claimed to be a Jew, but is found admittedly to be a Christian mission, missionary? No. Uh, okay, first of all, Shalom, Rachel, Shalom, you know, if, if it's you. Uh, if you marry to the person, then you're not really married, because you cannot be married to a person um, out of our faith. So it's not a real uh, wedding, you can take your badge and leave. Uh, if you're asking, what do you do uh, emotionally uh, because there's kids involved or there's love or there's a relationship and that's a whole different question. I'll cut, cut the answer short. If the person uh, you are totally against, then you don't need, you may maybe legally need to get divorced, but you can leave the person and they move on. That's in a simple situation. I know of a lady who found out uh, by her dying grandmother on her deathbed that she's Jewish and suddenly in her thirties she finds out that she's Jewish and she somehow got a hold of me, it was 10 years ago, it was easy to get a hold of me and she asked me, I found out I'm Jewish, what should I do? And when uh, she told me I'm married to a non-Jewish man, so I told him, divorce him, you can't be with him, not even one more second. So she gladly said, I, I was hoping you would tell me that and she I let him go uh, like a hot potato. But that's in a situation when it works like that. I know many people that the, the situation was uh, found out uh, at recent times, and but the person, lo they love each other. And there are kids there. And there's a lot of things involved here, and it's not so simple what you do in the situation. Now, of course, the simple situation is if the spouse wants to convert. But what if they don't want to convert? So, halakhically, you're not allowed to be with them. And there's more halakha in that, and, uh, and uh, the one needs to look into it. Uh, I'm sorry I can't answer you so easily in this uh, thread. But time is up, 10.02. I think we'll be talking for quite a while. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I enjoyed talking to you and meeting some names and faces. Uh, I will definitely do it uh, much more often. Uh, yeah, anyone here that is posting that they want to offer help, please email my assistant, rabbiaronova at gmail.com. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, invisible Song Stress. Definitely, we have other books that you can edit if you, if you wish. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate the comments. I appreciate the appreciation. And uh, uh, Sean... Middleton, how can I get a hold of you? That's the most common question that most people get, and unfortunately the answer is uh, not so simple. And not because I don't like it. Uh, it's because between, uh, let me tell you, let me share with you real quick before I get off the call. Uh, uh, first of all, most important, I am a God-fearing Jew. That takes me about three, four hours a day of being a servant of God, which includes mikveh, three prayers a day, and the minimum of the minimum of uh, learning and the mitzvot that I need to do. And that's already three, four hours a day, and I'm not talking about a day that, that I learn a lot of Torah. 
Besides that, Baruch Hashem, Hashem blessed me with a wonderful wife and seven amazing kids. So I'm a full-time job dad. My oldest is only 19. All the rest are uh, young kids. I dedicate most of my time to my kids. They're more important to me than anything. Uh, then I have a congregation. I have followers. I have classes that I prepare. I have uh, a whole a large amount of followers that follow me that uh, it's impossible to answer everybody's calls and questions. Uh, every time we enlarge our team, then the followers double. So now I need to get more people on our staff. And it's not so simple. Uh, I would like to be more accessible. But then top on that, then I have a few other things that I do. I have a few businesses that I own and run. I have my entire organization that we run many different events and and, uh, and uh, different things. So it's very, very high. I'm really on a fine, fine, thin line here that it's very, very possible to just dedicate time to, to, to almost anyone. And that's the sacrifice that I decided to take many, many years ago that my rabbi told me over a decade. You have to decide, are you going to be a rabbi for a small group of people and you influence their life day and night? Or are you a rabbi for thousands and thousands of people, which you influence them just as well, but not on a personal relationship, and unfortunately that's the situation where I am. Uh, but I do appreciate all the comments, I appreciate the love and the hearts and the appreciation and uh, continue showing this appreciation with sharing all the videos, liking, subscribing. All that is very, very important because when you share, you spread the like. When you subscribe, uh, you, you nourish the, the channel that uh, YouTube starts sharing the videos more. So anything that you can help with is amazing and you definitely, definitely want to be involved in any mitzvah that you can. Uh, I'm going to wish you again a happy Zayn Ba'adal. Go recite the prayers that I mentioned. I love you all. Happy Purim. Happy Pesach if I don't see you. I hope to see you in New York, Miami, New Jersey, and then later on in Los Angeles and the rest of the cities. I apologize that I don't uh, reply and answer everybody, but please, when it comes to contacting us, be patient. Sometimes we get very busy. Sometimes we get overloaded with messages. We try to do whatever we can. And Be'ezrat uh, Hashem, Be'ezrat Hashem, uh, I will be able to some way or another meet you and shake your hand, or if you're a lady, uh, uh, not shake your hand. And, uh, and Be'ezrat Hashem, I hope that we can all together as, as, as a whole do something significant in the world and change the world in a positive way and show the Master of the Universe that we're worthy and see Finally, the coming of Mashiach, Bezat Hashem. I bless you all. I love you all. Chag Sameach. I hope to see you on my trip. Please follow all the links in the description, all the prayers, all the things that you can participate in. Please do. It's good for you. It's good for the world. And may God bless you with the ultimate blessing of happiness, success, health, peace in your heart, and everything that your heart desires. I love you very much. I'm going to read a few more uh, uh, as I'm going out. Uh, I will help in LAX. Great. Kim, I remember you. Uh, 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 send a message to, our, uh, to my assistant. Uh, we can definitely need help in LA. I remember you, by the way, from maybe six or seven years ago. Uh, I love you too. I love you too. I love you too. Amen, 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 amen. <laughs> what you need to do, where can we buy the Omer book? Uh, the, the link is in the description, but you, need, you can go to... Uh, I don't know, actually I see that it's not in the description. So, uh, either... Uh, either... Oh, I think it left for that. I don't, know if you, I don't know if you see me, but I think it got cut off. Uh, hopefully, 
I don't know if it's still recording. Here it seems to me like it's off. If you hear me, then uh, uh, you can find the book on school.com, but we will, we will put it in the description. I don't know if I'm still alive or if I'm talking to myself, but uh, whatever happens, all the best. I love you.